Yes, so welcome to the RSS. We're very pleased to have you here for this joint meeting of the uh, Data Ethics and Governance section and the History of Statistics section. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about the historical emergence of uh, ethics uh, and data governance with some people who uh, were, were there at the time. And really, this is a theme of statisticians talking about uh, data science. We like to tell the data scientists, the, com the computational scientists particularly, that we thought of it last century. And that's what we're going to do about data ethics, because we have um, various people who've been working on this for quite a long time. Uh, but I will go through the, the program uh, as, as we come to it. But we're going to start with um, Peter Elias, who's the chair of the section, um, talking about privacy, human rights, and data ethics. How did we get here? Drawing on his own experience um, working internationally with the OECD and a lot of work that he's done here in the UK with, with the, the, the research councils. So um, I will hand over to, to Peter in a moment, but we'll just, just uh, the, the structure of today, we'll have a tea break for half an hour uh, and then we'll come back. We'll have uh, speakers with questions after each speaker, and then at the end of the event, we'll have a panel discussion, uh, which Peter is going to chair. Uh, but we are being recorded today, um, and so if you want to ask a question, I hope I will be able to ask you uh, to use a microphone. Uh, I, I, I do just-in-time organization, so I haven't got a microphone at the moment. So we, we, we will see how that goes, um, but for, for the moment, um, I'm going to ask you to, to listen to Peter, uh, and after that, we will hear from Halgrim Moses Norrison, uh, Denise Leavesley, Walter Raudemacher, and John Pullinger, and then we will have a break. So I will hand over now to, to Peter to give the first talk. Well, thank you very much, Tom, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. This is one of the first, well, in fact, it is the first face-to-face -face meeting of this newly formed section. Although we've been in existence for almost a year now, then uh, this is the first time that we've met here in Errol Street in Face to Face. So uh, I'm pleased that so many of you have been able to, to come along. What we're doing with this afternoon is a kind of skipping through a lot of history, a lot of events. Uh, we can't do justice to the immense amount of work that's taken place over the last 60 years or so, or 80 years. Um, but we want to give you something of a flavour because I think it's important when we talk about ethics and data that we should understand a little bit more about the background. Some of you are probably very familiar with what I'm going to talk about today. For others, it might be quite interesting, I hope. So the title of my short talk, and I will keep it short, I've only got another eight slides after this one, uh, is Human Rights, Privacy and Data Ethics. How did we get here? So, the first slide I have. Um, do any of you recognise this woman? Well, no. You might then recognise her partner. Okay. Here we have the Roosevelt's. Eleanor and Franklin. And despite what a lot of people say about the Roosevelt's, I have great admiration for the work that they did, particularly the work that she did. Um, because, of course, you know that Franklin Roosevelt died uh, just before the end of World War II. But the work that his wife was already uh, taking underway uh, was co it continued. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt is famous for what's called the Four Freedoms speech. This was a speech he gave in 1940, when the USA was on the cusp of war. Uh, so events were yet to happen in Japan. Uh, the Lend-Lease program was starting up. Uh, they could see that a lot of military aid and help was required for Europe, uh, with Britain standing alone. And... Uh, the Four Freedom Speech was uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, 
freedom from want and, importantly, freedom from fear. And that was the fear that the kind of authoritarian fascist regimes seen in various parts of the world, in Japan, uh, in, uh, in Germany at that time, um, would gain an upper hand. And it was essential, uh, Roosevelt saw, that there should be uh, a lot of information put, put out about this. And that's the, the basis of his, his Four Freedoms speech. But it was that um, freedom, uh, freedom from fear which was really important because the big fear after the war, of course, uh, when the Iron Curtain came down, was that there was a lot of interference in people's private lives. And fear was the fear that somebody would intercept your telecommunications, your letters. There was no electronic communications uh, very much in those days. And that led uh, inevitably to um, the work of the, the UN Commission on Human Rights that Eleanor uh, headed uh, over uh, subsequent years. And she chaired the UN Commission on Human Rights and that led to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And of course, uh, we saw within that um, Article 8, particularly, the right to respect for, you know, excuse the pronouns, this is actually lifted from the, the articles, his private and family life, his home, and his correspondence. It should be, of course, their private and family life their homes and their correspondence. That was a really big concern at the time, and that led to this view that privacy was, uh, was so important it should become a human right. But it's not a qualified right. Even in the article, it states that if there is a sound legal basis for uh, access to information about individuals, and that could be to do with health, it could to do, to do with uh, uh, the, 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 the way um, local uh, national legislation has been framed. So many countries could sign up for this because they could see that there were loopholes that they could get through, and of course they subsequently have used that. So although many of us think we have this universal right because it's a universal human right for privacy. It's very much a qualified right, and that's something that's always worth bearing in mind. We move on from that into the electronic age. And um, I kind of skipped over the fact that uh, the US was pressing after the war for a more united Europe. And after a lot of argument between countries, European countries, the Council of Europe was finally set up. And the Council of Europe, which of course exists to this day, was important because the Council of Europe adopted the European Convention on Human Rights. And what was really important about that was that it was upheld through the European Court of Justice so that there was a legal instrument that people could turn to if they felt that their uh, rights in terms of the European uh, Convention on Human Rights uh, had been abrogated in some way. So there was then a legal framework set up. Um, we moved then on into the electronic age. And of course, we've got the beginnings of the European Union. We've got the uh, European Economic Area, a small number of countries at that time. But they were beginning to get together. They were concerned, of course, with trade rather than with anything to do with human rights. That was the work of the Council of Europe. Don't confuse the Council of Europe with the European Council. The Council of Europe is really not uh, anything to do with the European Union. It's existed prior to the European Union uh, and it has 46 member states today. But in the electronic age, of course, they had to think about the way in which computers were handling much larger amounts of information than had ever been the case in the past. And there was this important uh, report of the Committee on Privacy in the UK in 1972 about those who handle personal information, 
uh, can no longer remain the sole judges of whether their systems can adequately safeguard privacy. But nothing much really happened until the OECD picked up on this quite a bit later in 1978. And the OECD set out seven basic principles for uh, data protection, essentially. Data should be fair, proportionate, accurate, not used for alternative purpose without consent, safeguarded and discoverable. But again, not much happened at the European level until around about 1992 when it was picked up and eventually, of course, we had the, the directive, the Data Protection Directive in 1995. And as you all know, a directive is very different from a regulation. So a directive is an agreement that countries will respect uh, whatever has been decided upon and they will transpose it into their national law. Now that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. So we were in a bit of a mess right the way through from 1995 to 2018 in terms of there being differences between countries in the way in which they uh, enacted the, uh, the, the, the directive. That all changed in 2018 with the uh, General Data Protection Regulation. Interestingly, when you read that, you realise that it's the OECD work from 40 years earlier that's embodied now within the General Data Protection Regulation, the seven basic principles. So, the uh, European GDPR uh, UK uh, GDPR, the Data Protection Act 2018. Uh, we, of course, have now left the European Union. There is talk about some, being, some reform of our data protection uh, legislation. Uh, that's kind of being discussed at the moment. Uh, it's going to be a very hot potato, uh, and I shall follow that with uh, interest. But one thing we should remember is that a lot of people think that the General Data Protection Regulation is all about consent. You have to give consent nowadays for anything to happen. That is just not the case. Consent is only one of the bases for lawful data processing. And quite honestly, from a st statistical perspective or from a research perspective, it's really not the best uh, basis for data processing and legitimate interest is the one that most universities are following and most of the research councils are following that this is uh, the, the lawful basis for, for data processing is the legitimate interest that these organisations have in access to personal data. I haven't said much about ethics so far apart from talking about the origins of the interest in privacy and the way in which privacy has now been enshrined in various pieces of legislation. And I think it was really a comment from Denise Leavesley, who will be talking later on, that made me think about uh, what we call data ethics. And it should really be data and ethics, because ethics has been around for a long time more than 2,000 years, uh, some would say more than 3,000 years. We've had concerns about you know, what is the right thing to do and what is the right thing to do with our data. And I would argue that data and ethics is not just about consent and privacy. It's about understanding whether there is potential harm in what we do. Not harm in terms of there being a release of a piece of information about an individual who says, well, you shouldn't have released that bit of information about me, although of course that may do genuine harm, but about the purpose for which you put those data and your research. When the research is done, or maybe even when it's only half done, if you release some information about those research findings, can you harm groups and individuals who may not be the subjects of your research, but who are uh, a, a linked group, a linked group in terms of their interests uh, and, and their, their, 
the, the, their responsibilities. Equally, it's incumbent upon us to look at the public benefit. Why do we want to do what we do? If we can't explain the public benefit in doing it, maybe it's just not worth doing. We also need regard for the public perception of what we're doing. We may have consent. We may have taken steps to safeguard the privacy. We may have thought about the potential harm that we do. But there may be a public perception out there that this is just not right. Now, we've seen that before with health data, with the uh, care dot data problems that we had some years ago when people suddenly said, well, I, I'm not sure about this. I'm, I, I've never uh, signed up for this. You know, I mean, it's not a question of consent. I just don't think people should be doing that kind of thing with our data. And that uh, public perception uh, has to be countered via engagement. In other words, if you don't tell people what you're doing, if you don't explain why you're doing it, then you're going to have a problem. So how might statisticians ensure that they're conducting their analyses in an ethical manner? For this, we often rely on what we call an ethics committee. And it might be an ethics committee of uh, a university, an organisation, uh, or it might be the National Statistics uh, Data Ethics Committee, National Statisticians Data Ethics Committee. And these data ethics committees have this task of weighing up public benefit on the one hand and harm on the other. But of course, they also want to know about the public perception of research. And this is a really big and important and very difficult task. And this is why we rely so much on our ethics committees. Privacy, we can look into this by using a secure data service, for example, and we're going to have a conversation later on, a presentation from Felix Ritchie, who will be talking about the way in which this has been developed over the years. And what is the role of the statistician in all this? This is just my final slide uh, to leave these questions hanging or these statements I need, to be aware of and to respond appropriately to requirements for data access. That's what we need to do. We need to validate our work. We need to interpret them cautiously. We cannot make uh, statements that overstep what we have found out. We need to communicate appropriately in a manner that maximises the public benefit in terms of what we were doing, but also, of course, indicates where there is potential harm. And... I think we, as uh, statisticians in the statistical profession, we have a responsibility to talk to and train others when appropriate in, uh, in, in what we call data and ethics. So I'm going to stop at that point because we've got a lot of interesting presentations coming up. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Thanks very much, Peter. I, I originally proposed our subject section should be data and ethics, and I was firmly put in my place by um, uh, our president-elect, Andy Garrett, actually, who's here today. He said, that, was, that was encroaching on the data science section. But in fact, every part of the RSS is interested in data and ought to be interested in ethics. So we, we, we needed to focus and actually then establish what we mean and explain it to people and actually people have found this really hard to understand and I, I, I guess I was going to ask you a question I, have you managed to explain what really you're aiming at by this concern to people easily Peter or, or do people find that hard to pick up that you're saying something it's not just be professional I think that's a, a, an important question. I don't have an answer to that, really. All, all I can say is that over the years that I've been a researcher, I've lurched from one perspective to another, uh, sometimes so angry that I've been denied access, but I can't really understand why I've been denied access. Sometimes that anger is not misplaced. Sometimes it's been a real a kind of difficulty, problems that uh, you've, you've come across, which are not to do with ethics, they're to do with communication or to do with understanding 
Um, and that's why I think it's so important that all of us should have the very best understanding of what it is we have to do when we address ethical issues uh, in the process of gaining access to, to, to data. A lot of personal data nowadays has got immense value and it's locked up for reasons that some of us can't quite understand, sometimes very good reasons, but quite often these are things that can be sorted out and they are to do with uh, culture, they're to do with misunderstanding, they're to do with misinterpretation. And uh, we have to iron all of that out of the way and get down to the real issues about the potential for harm that we might do, uh, the potential benefit that might derive from our research. And I think that's, if I can push forward one message above all else, it would be that. So the, this challenge of communication is why we, we wanted to have people here and really wanted people to come. So we're very glad that you're here and we'd like you to talk to each other. And so we, we hope we'll have plenty of time for a break. Um, I don't have a microphone, so I'm going to try to uh, ask people who do have questions to ask a question and get the, the, uh, the speaker to summarise it for, for the record so we do have this and then, and then respond. But having already started late and taken up too much time, I'm going to move on to uh, Halgrimer uh, Snarrison now, who's going to be the first of two speakers talking about how the ethics arose in the professional concern in two other settings um, about from the International Statistics Institute uh, and the UN Economic Commission for, for Europe uh, as, a, as a different per, per perspective from the, the data users that uh, Peter um, uh, set out. So Halgrimer is going to uh, talk about the UN fundamental principles uh, and experience of 30 years. And he was um, director of the uh, Statistics Iceland for more than 20 years it, 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 in that period beginning in the 1980s. Uh, and so has been participating in these international meetings for a long time. He retired about 15 years ago and has been consulting in various countries with international organisations such as the IMF, the World Bank uh, and things like that. But like several people here, he's been president of the uh, International Association of, of Official Statistics um, uh, and has a lot of experience to share, share, share with us on that. So I will hand over to Halgrimer now um, and um, we will have uh, his talk and some questions and then uh, Denise, but thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Nice to be here in such an elevated audience in front of you. Um, I understand now the reason why I was asked to uh, come here. I am a kind of a relic of the past. <laughs> uh, and and, and uh, me, together with Denise Leavesley, we are one of the few who are still sort of remember what was happened some 30 years ago when these fundamental principles of official statistics were first developed. Um, okay. So I'll first talk a little bit about the milestones. What, that's more formalistic than anything else, but still some history behind it. And um, I'll talk about a little bit the conditions in the international statistical cooperation around this time when the uh, principles were developed and then I will talk about the principles themselves and go on from there a little bit. I'll just go very quickly over these that these fundamental principles they were developed around 1990 and uh, they were developed by a group of European statisticians at the Conference of European Statisticians, the CES and that's of the UN Economic Commission for Europe. And for those of you who are not familiar with that, and I'm pretty sure that's most of you, the CES, Conference of European Statisticians, was in fact at that time, or had been for a long time, the main forum for statistical cooperation in not only Europe, but what um, 
what uh, the UN defines as Europe, which is basically Europe plus the US plus Australia, Canada, <laughs> even Mexico, and now later on Brazil and something like that. So it's, it's, it's fluent, or fluid, let's say. Anyway, this was the main place, forum for statistical cooperation. And, um, and then, of course, that role was later more or less replaced by other fora, not least in Europe, like, uh, like the Eurostat meetings and so on and so forth. Um, anyway, let's go on with this. There were, at this time, um, well, okay, these were developed in 1991. They were adopted by the conference in 1991. They were, they were adopted at the ministerial level by the UNECE in 92. They were adopted by the Statistical Commission, UN Statistical Commission, which is the, formerly the main worldwide statistical cooperation body in, in official statistics. Um, in 2013, they were the, the Economic and Social Commission adopted the principles and recommended that the General Assembly of the UN adopted them. That was done in 2014. Very memorable day, on 29th of January. That's my birthday, so I remember <laughs> it all the time. Okay. Anyway, let's go back to this, the, the situation at the time. Uh, the reasons for the fundamental principles. Well, you will, of course, know that around 1919 was a turning point in, in, in European history, the breakdown of the Soviet Union and, and, and all of that. And that, that was also a turning point in statistical cooperation. The CES, the Conference of European Statisticians, which met every year in June in Geneva, and had a bureau and then some working groups, etc., etc., had until that time been the one place in the world basically where the two basic systems of statistics came together. That's to say, the statistical systems based on the normal kind of market economy and so on of the West, and the, the statistical system, the bookkeeping system based on the planned economies of the. Of the of Soviet Union and similar countries. So CES was the meeting point of those systems. And when I came there first in 1985, I was flabbergasted by the long time it was spent on discussing the differences in these two statistical systems and how they could be reconciled. Now in 1990, everything broke down. The Soviet system was no longer there, the planning system was no longer there, something new had to be done. Basically, the new democracies had to adopt the ways of the West, and which they did. But then we had a problem. Um, the problem was, of course, that there was no trust in statistics in Eastern and Central Europe, because this had been a bookkeeping kind of thing. Um, the targets were always the planning targets, the production target. So all the, let's say, economic statistics and a lot of the social statistics as well had all been there to, to let's say, they were to gather data to somehow see if you were fulfilling these targets or to what extent you were fulfilling these targets or what extent not. Now, this of course was basically all based on nothing because uh, it was the easiest thing in the world to fill in some formula, formula for in some forms, etc., etc. So these, these huge, huge bookkeeping systems were basically, um, let's say, they were fictive. They, 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 they were fictions. There were very little real data in them. But let's not debate that to the extent to which the data was real or not. But it was absolutely clear that the people in those countries had no trust in these statistics. So the trust had to be re rebuilt. 
And that was the basic difficulty, the near total lack of the, of the trust in official statistics, and the basic task was how to restore that trust in official statistics. And there was acknowledgement that some fundamental change was needed for this. And, and, and uh, a fun fundamental change in, in, in attitude and in outlook, and away from this enforced data collection uh, towards the, uh, let's say, kind of voluntary surveys that were carried out in, in, in Western Europe, similarly classical statistical surveys, etc., etc. And, uh, and, and there were some rules that were needed for this. And these rules needed to be proclaimed and, 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 and preached and so on and so forth. And uh, so the rules, they needed a foundation in general. Uh, uh, and, and that is the kind of basis thinking for the fundamental principles. We needed a, a set of rules to guide the, the official statistics. So what are the ten principles? I don't know if anybody knows them or somebody, absolutely. Anyway, there are ten principles. They were deliberately made very, very short. They were called Ten Commandments at the time. Uh, some people, when they were putting these together first, compiling them and writing them down, they were long, long sentences and long principles, etc. but it was cut down to, to a very kind of basic thing. And the, and the, so I'll go through them anyway. The first principle is the obligation of government of official statistical agencies, but basically of the government, to compile official statistics and make them available to the public. Now, th this was something new. This was something new. Particularly this, to make them available to the public. That was absolutely new. That had never been a kind of a requirement. Okay? The second one, that statistical agencies say national statistical offices, shall determine their methods and procedures according to strictly professional considerations, including scientific principles and professional ethics. Now, there are two things in here, I think, which are very important. First of all, it's this professional autonomy and responsibility which comes along with that. And then, secondly, the transparency involved in it. Um, but this had to be transparent and had to be proclaimed. The third principle was that the agencies need to present their information according to scientific standards on the sources, methods, and procedures. Again, the issue of transparency. And this is, is, is very much a, 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 one of the main points, I think, of the fundamental principles is this insistence on transparency. The fourth principle, statistical agencies are entitled to comment on erroneous interpretation and misuse of statistics. It's an interesting one. This, of course, is something that I suppose we, many of us, took for granted, even at that time, and absolutely now. But at that time, it was not taken for granted in the Eastern and Central Europe, and in many, many, many countries of the world. And, of course, this question, how do you comment on erroneous, uh, on erroneous interpretation by your own government? Well, that's a tricky one, and I, I have uh, faced it and had to go through it, and that, that's, that's okay, but that's a kind of a thing that is uh, very, very important, that you have this right, and that right, this right is, is accepted. Now, the fifth principle is about data it can be drawn from, from uh, all kinds of, of sources, including administrative uh, data and administrative records, etc., etc. This is also very much about cost effectiveness. That you draw, use the data, take the data from where it's, where it's most cost effective. Also, this comes related to another one, which is simply which is the response burden, not to increase the response burden overly. 
The sixth principle is about confidentiality. Infinite individual data collected by statistical agencies for statistical compilation uh, shall be strictly confidential and used exclusively for statistical purposes. Now, confidentiality was not new in statistics in 1990. I believe that, uh, I, I'm no expert in that, that the issue of confidentiality first arises shortly after the, after the war. So in the, in, the, in the years after the war, let's say late 40s, 50s, the, the, the issue, the notation of confidentialities comes into statistical legislation in some countries in Europe and somewhere else in the world. So confidentiality isn't new, but this is still one of the, of the heavy principles, I believe, this issue of confidentiality. The next is about the laws, regulation, measures are to be made public. Thank you. I'll get carried away. Thank you very much. Uh, that laws and, and regulations um, uh, under which the statistical systems operate are to be made public. Again, this is something that is so obvious to us that uh, it doesn't need discussion, but that what wasn't obvious in those time, in, in that time and in, not, in many, many countries after that. So it, this is a, again about transparency, but it's also something else. It presupposes that there are, that there is legislation for the statistics. And that, again, is not taken for given. I don't want to talk about the UK, but I believe that there haven't been so many laws about uh, statistics in this country, in, in official statistics in the country, if I remember correctly. Okay. Um, then the, th the last three principles talk about coordination, co internal coordination, which was very important at that time, it still is important, but that was basically a vehicle or a something, a tool for the national statistical agencies and other agency producing official statistics to say to other, let's say, producers, or providers of data that we need coordination, we, we cannot operate in, in isolation, this, the whole system needs to be coordinated. And then the same goes for the international cooperation and, and this again was thought to be very important by these countries in the past that uh, it, the insistence on using um, international classification and not domestic classifications. Um, again, this is a reality that, uh, um, well, there, there were a lot of domestic classifications around. There were regional classifications around, even in my part of the world, in the Nordic countries, there was a kind of a wave towards having Nordic classifications. Um, one of the first, or my first thing when I came to the office this almost 100 years ago was to try to change from the domestic classifications and Nordic classifications over to completely international classifications. And, and, and that was a very rewarding work because it gave, it, it opened the possibility for comparing the statistics between my country and other countries, etc. Same, same time. Okay, now, whom do the fundamental principles address? I believe you can say that there are kind of four different parties that are addressed by the principles. First of all, the authorities, as they contain stipulations on the basis and working conditions for official statistics. Then there is a statistical staff. The principles, they give effective and, 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 and decisive guidance on the professionalism and impartiality in statistical work. Then we have the respondents, the data providers. The principles, they stipulate that data is only collected and utilized for good statistical purposes. And this is a very important thing. And 
for us when we were trying to convince people to participate in our surveys, this was one of the things that we tried to preach. preach. And then the uses of statistics. That I believe the, the um, principles form a kind of a regulatory framework which is useful for assessment of official statistical activities and outputs in terms of quality, purpose, practices and other issues. The, as I see it, the application of the principles, the UN fundamental principles, they are comprehensive and they are indisputable as a whole and individually. In individually. The initial interpretation, uh, implementation may present problems, but once implemented, they are not difficult to follow and respect. They are effective guidelines. And um, uh, yes. I believe that the, the principle of professional autonomy of the national statistical producers, not only the national statistical office, but all the producers of official statistics, is of paramount importance. Now, perhaps the main principle, confidentiality. Statistical source data is used solely for statistical purposes. Now, I could take administrative record and use them for statistical purposes. I cannot make, take statistical data and hand them over to any government to be used for any kind of administrative purposes of that. It's a very simple rule. It's a one-way flow. It cannot flow back. And we've had difficulties with that in some countries, even in the UK, about trade data and, and so on, where, where, uh, where this issue has, has arisen. And um, then I would say that applying the fundamental principles is not sufficient. Their applications need to be publicly proclaimed. Now, if we simply shut up and don't tell anybody about our fundamental principles, etc., they are of no use. Now, we can educate our statistical staff and so on, and that's fine, but that's not enough. We have to tell our users, our data providers, and our authorities these are the conditions under which we op operate and we stick to them. And you have to observe that and respect it. Now, I would also say that it is the, the, this principle of applying the international standards, methods and best practices in order to ensure quality, usefulness and development. This is, is embedded in this uh, in, in, these, uh, in the principle number nine, and I think that is uh, uh, one of the, that's a heavy one also in, in, this, in this respect. Little bit about implementation. The principles that were implemented quite quickly in most of the new democracies, so to speak. So quite quick, very quick, okay, right. Uh, they came into statistical laws, etc. Many other countries uh, uh, also uh, realized the significance and, and adopted them. They have influenced uh, other, uh, um, other legislation or regulatory frameworks like, and they have become backbones of laws, etc., etc., like um, the data, data dissemination standards of the IMF and, and European statistical legislation, the code of practice, etc., etc. Now, just to round off, sorry. Uh, in 2024 marks the, the 30th uh, anniversary of the uh, fundamental principles, uh, their adoption by the UN. It was 30 years this, uh, uh, this year for the, for the CES, for, the, for Europe, etc. And, uh, and there are some plans to, to revive, take this opportunity to revive in discussion of the importance, etc., etc. There is no real discussion, I believe, on changing the, 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 the principles they are forceful and, and, and they are there. Uh, there are some discussions on extending them, perhaps to some, uh, some uh, private producers, etc. Uh, I have my doubts on that. I think those need, such needs can be met in other ways, particularly by applying ethical principles to, to those, in, in those cases. Um, and uh, of course, there will be 
as I, far as I understand, there will be some um, priority given to trying to enforce the implementation of the principles uh, internationally. Thank you very much. Do, does anybody want to ask uh, Halgrim a, a question? Um, I, I, Jane, Jane does. Could you say, say the question and I'll repeat it to the, to the microphone? So is there a dialogue between the people developing the UN principles and the other people who've worked on the sustainable development goals who did, I think, work with the private sector? Yes. As, as far as I understand, I mean, the fundamental principles were developed many years ago and, and then they have been discussed, etc., etc., and uh, their extension is being debated, but but as for the sustainable development goals, I think they, or let's say the compilation of SDG indicators rests quite heavily on the, on the fundamental principles or, or the same thinking as in the fundamental principles. And there are some of the principles that apply directly through the, um, through the uh, sustainable development goals. One of them is the kind of embedded human rights aspect of the, of the fundamental principles. But there are also technical things, like uh, the principle that data can, you can use all kinds of source data for, for, for official statistics as long as, as, as you see that uh, that serves a good purpose, etc. So yes, I think the SDGs are really, are based on, partly on that. Oh, okay, um, I, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm not doing very well at keeping time, so... Um, uh, no, I, I think I started it. You, you've got to set a tone of having the right pace for these, and I've, I've already run on. So the next speaker is uh, Denise Leavesley, um, our second former president of the International Association of, of, of Official Statistics. There, there are two more to come, I've realised. <laughs> uh, but Denise has also been president of the RSS, uh, and various other things, but uh, she uh, ran several of the data institutions, the, the UK Data Archive, uh, as is now, uh, and the Information Centre for Health and Social Care. But even before then, she was involved in work with the ISI, which is, I think, where she's going to start. Her story. Right. So over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you to, to Peter for this invitation. I think I'm going to compliment what Halgrimur has been saying, and also trail what uh, Walter Rademacher will be addressing, because I'm going to be contrasting the, fundamental, the UN fundamental principles with the ISI Declaration on Professional Ethics. I don't have a PowerPoint, but I wanted you to have the, the two references there. As Hal Grimuir has outlined, the fundamental principles are critically important um, to statisticians working in official agencies. They provide protection, enable them to challenge corrupt use of statistics, and empower them to fight for the integrity of statistics. But they're also a really good defense for those of us outside of official statistics agencies to call our governments, and sometimes, unfortunately, our colleagues too, to account, and they've given us really good material to campaign for official statistics we can trust. Um, I wanted to make the point that not all official statisticians work in national agencies. Um, I'm thinking particularly of those of, who, who work in UN, other international and regional bodies, and often they, they're involved in compiling data which has been gathered from national agencies. Their compilations, aggregations, comparative analyses do impact on the quality or the perceived quality of national data. And particular problems arise when data are missing for particular countries. And the use of proxy data 
or imputation in such circumstances can undermine the ability of national statisticians to fight for the resources they need. Um, but there is pressure on international statisticians to produce global estimates, so the issue of missing data is a challenge. An additional issue is that many international statisticians Work, may work in agencies with a strong advocacy role. And I'll come back to that in a second. A further complication is that not all agencies have someone designated to lead their work on statistics. Sometimes statistical work is very fragmented and it's inconsistently managed across the organisation, not always carried out by statisticians. So, just coming back to the advocacy, um, when I was recruited to UNESCO as Director of Statistics, I inherited responsibility for data such as the number of children in the world without access to schooling. And if the speech writers at UNESCO didn't think the figure we produced was exciting enough, they had a tendency to double it or triple it. You know, if 52 million children out of school didn't sound big enough, because they wanted to get more funding for this issue, they would change it. Demonstrating that that manipulation of data undermined the credibility of the whole organization was one of my most difficult and the earliest task I had to do. So I was very pleased when the groups of heads of statistics for the international and regional official agencies, the UN, Bretton Woods establishments, etc., decided to adopt and adapt the UN fundamental principles. And I think we've seen improvements in the quality and transparency of global data as a result. But let me move on to the ISI um, declaration on professional ethics. Um, I'm referring to the original version of this declaration. I think Volta is going to be talking a bit more about what's happening more recently. The original version of the declaration was produced in the 1980s and it was actually based on the ethical guidelines produced by a committee that I chaired for the Social Research Association. I think not everybody appreciates this. Um, and it did fully exploit research by my boss at the time, Professor Sir Roger Jowell. And then he went on to chair the ISI committee. Um, and it is important to realise that the origins of the ISI guidelines. Um, they were developed as an educational tool. And importantly, unlike the fundamental principles, they're not a set of rules. Too often, particularly in universities, ethical procedures are seen as a necessary but undesirable obstacle. Too often, they're viewed as a checklist which needs to be ticked, but don't, don't impact on practice at all. The philosophy of the ISI guidelines, on the other hand, is to make one think about the purpose and the impact of statistical work. My interpretation is that they address four themes, ensuring honesty and integrity, avoiding overclaiming, promoting transparency, and delivering public good. Um, the whole of the declaration was designed to make explicit and share professional values, and it addresses the tensions between the different responsibilities of a social researcher, statistician. And in that regard, it does differ from the codes of conduct of many professional organizations, which are really about protecting the profession and drawing boundaries around it, rather than seeking ways in which the profession can help society. So the aim of the ISI declaration is to enable the statistician's individual ethical judgment and decisions, and to make sure that they're informed by values and experience, rather than imposed by the profession. And it seeks to document widely held principles of statistical inquiry, and to identify factors that obstruct their implementation. It's also framed in the recognition that sometimes the operation of one principle impedes the operation of another. And it's interesting, I actually picked on an example that, that Peter was drawing on. 
The tension between, on the one hand, maximising the use of data in accordance with the scientific principle, that as an ex-data archivist I would say that research findings together with the data should be available for others to refute, confirm, clarify or extend the results. Um, and on the other hand, the issue of respecting informed consent of research participants. Now, how do we explain to research participants that we can't anticipate all the uses of the data? Um, so there is really great discussion about legitimate interest and the public benefit. The guidelines discuss the tensions between statisticians' responsibilities to society, to funders and employers, to colleagues, and to the subjects of research, highlighting that statisticians can have competing obligations, not all of which can be fulfilled simultaneously, and that sometimes we have to make implicit or even explicit choices between the different principles. Um, it doesn't attempt to resolve these choices or even to allocate greater priority to one principle rather than another, but it provides a framework within which the conscientious statistician should, for the most part, be able to work comfortably. Um, so I tend to think about uh, the framework that's providing, um, providing uh, an opportunity for us to have discussions so that our decisions are, deliberation, are made deliberately rather than ignorantly. I was working at Social and Community Plan and Research, now the National Centre for Social Research, NATSEN. At the time, the Declaration on Ethics was produced. Um, and it was used within that organisation as a framework to structure our decisions. This was facilitated by a very helpful ethics committee, which Roger Jowell established and chaired. I went back to some of those documents the other day and uh, found two really interesting discussions that that ethics committee had. One was about my own research. My research topic was the impact of non-response on surveys. And I was addressing the issue as to what sort of people refuse to participate in surveys. Why? What were they reasoning for doing so? In order to understand how the survey findings were affected. So you can argue it was a public good piece of research, I hope so. Certainly the SRC that funded it thought it was. But is it ethical to return to people who've refused to participate to ask them why? And if you don't find them at home, can you collect information about them? Is there a clear distinction between public information and private information? We had great debates on the Ethics Committee on these issues, and they, they really guided my decision-making as I planned that research. My second example was a survey in which a representative sample of the population was asked about their unprescribed medicine-taking, and information was also collected from them about their prescribed medicines. But what if we found an individual was putting themselves in danger by the combination or volume of medicines they were taking? What should we do as researchers in this situation? Could we break the pledge of confidentiality? SCPR's use of the declaration was entirely in accordance with its intention, which is to be informative and descriptive rather than authoritarian or prescriptive. Unfortunately, I think that practice of ethical debate is relatively uncommon. And I'm particularly concerned that values and ethics don't have a more prominent place in the education of statisticians and data scientists. I worry that too often I hear students and even more senior researchers complain about the ethical processes, seeing them as delaying and complicating their research rather than informing it. Of course, this is in the context where increasing pressures are put on students and academics to deliver. They must publish or perish, without enough consideration given to the impact of such, such an incentive-driven system. Similarly, there's an increasing pressure on statisticians to be visible, to communicate their findings in accessible ways. 
I'd argue that statisticians need to strike a really difficult balance between humility and confidence. We can be very proud of the higher profile of statisticians during the pandemic and the increased understanding of the public and the importance of data. But I think we've also seen some scientists beguiled by the media and drawn into discussions beyond their competence and certainly beyond their evidence. Of course, the world has changed since 1986 when the declaration was adopted. Today, I often describe the UK as the land of the performance indicator whereby so many of our public bodies are driven by regulations which can lead to the man manipulation of data which is so critical for the purposes of accountability. The RSS paper, The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, about performance indicators, re remains a really great exposure of the benefits and risks to, st to statistics of the rise of performance monitoring. I guess we're all familiar with Goodhart's law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. David Boyle's paradox in the tyranny of numbers. If we don't count something, it gets ignored. If we do count it, it gets perverted. The ISI declaration was developed in the context of social science, and the underlying assumption is that research data were collected specially for statistical research purposes and in compliance where possible with the, informed, the concept of informed consent. But of course, increasingly, we're using data collected for entirely different purposes. And I think we've got to review the ethical aspects of our work in that situation. I would argue that providing information on the quality of data and on a, the quality of our analysis is fundamental. Brad Efron's quote is relevant here. I think that scientists have misled themselves into thinking that if you collect enormous amounts of data, you're bound to get the right answer. Similarly, the declaration has relatively little to say on the important topic of interdisciplinarity. I was at a talk last week by Jeremy Farrer, the head of the Wellcome Foundation, at which he talked about the importance of what he called radical interdisciplinarity, and he argued that all the important questions lie in the gaps between disciplines. Although the ISI code entreats us to understand and respect the ethical position of colleagues, I think we as statisticians need to be braver in taking a lead in interdisciplinary teams. Too often we're in the metaphorical back room. We do care about protecting the integrity of our data and our findings, and we need to speak up about this. And I was going to say that maybe that's a good point to stop, but I think before I do, I need to acknowledge that many statisticians in many countries of the world can't have this sort of conversation, because they're working in, in countries with malign governments. They're really not free to discuss ethics. I don't know if many of you watched Simon Sharma's programme on BBC Two last night. If not, do. He quoted Harvell's book, The Power of the Powerless, in which he talks about the falsification of statistics. Um, it was a really amazing programme. Thank you for the invitation. So... I, I was going to ask uh, Denise something, because you started by talking about um, how you could see problems quite close to home, uh, and you were developing principles for that. I, I think we would agree there'd been progress there, but now everybody is using data for all kinds of things, and they can all do strange things with it as well. And is the use of data increasing at a rate faster than we are able to promulgate ethics? Are we keeping pace, or is it, it, are we at, at risk of things getting worse because actually the, the, the application of uh, poor practice uh, has more, uh, it, yes, it is moving fast? Um, I quote Roger Jowell again, my hero. Um, who said that there's too much data untouched by human mind. So I would really worry if the implication of what you're saying is that we draw back and we don't get data used. I think it's really critical that we get the data used. 
But as I said, I don't think that we discuss ethics enough. I don't think we discuss it with young people enough. Um, I won't mention the university, but uh, just recently I looked at the MSc program for a good university, MSc in statistics program, and there was nothing on ethics. So I offered to go and give a talk on ethics. And uh, I went to give the talk, and there was one student in the room. <laughs> there were lots of staff. It was great. They were, I think they felt obliged to come. But uh, there was one student. Um, because I don't think the students saw it as relevant to them. Um, and I don't think we have these discussions enough with, with junior colleagues um, and with students. Well, as you know, um, I, I spoke about the, the education gap in, in the conference in Aberdeen, and it is one of the, pre uh, the priorities for the section that we think if it's not happening, actually perhaps we need to do something. And we're, we're working on engaging with the Alan Turing Institute on, on that point. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to ask Denise that. Does anybody else want to ask something of uh, Denise? Uh, yes, yes. Could you summarise the question for the... So, you were asking particularly about the data, the data com committee, the ethics committee in relation to the administrative data research yeah, network and... It's really essentially that the forms that the ethics committee use, do you think actually capture the data that enable them to make a decision on the ethics or things like administrative data? I think... Um, so, I was asked whether the forms that are used actually capture the relevant data in order to make informed decisions about. There's a huge variety of different ethics committees and I, I mentioned one that we had at SCPR that I thought worked really, really well. Um, but it wasn't about forms, it was about discussion, it was about debate, it was about throwing back ideas and discussing um, the balance between public good and public harm. Um, and so I think the trouble is that we've often gone over to bureaucratic form-filling systems and that, that leads to the sort of tick box mentality. Um, in my college in Oxford, I used to have, on Thursday lunchtimes, I used to have lunch with PhD students in order to discuss with them um, issues that they were confronting. And I was quite shocked at the number of times that they came to those discussions complaining about ethics rather than actually understanding or being informed by them. Okay, uh, we, we do have to move on. Uh, Peter has learned that uh, asking me to chair things is not really a good solution to running on time. So uh, our, um, our next speaker is Walter Rademacher, who's um, chairing the uh, ISI Advisory Board on Ethics but not yet uh, president of the International Association of Official Statistics. <laughs> he was, however, director general uh, at, uh, at Eurostat and uh, Distatis. Um, and actually, it was, it was Walter who reached out to, to us um, earlier this year to say that we should try to work on uh, something um, together and bringing in the kinds of concerns that Denise said that some countries can't have these conversations and actually is um, the current work we're doing fit for purpose. In terms of engaging with the, the private sector, I, I think although we've got, um, we can see the, the, the ideas behind the principles have been uh, developed very well. Perhaps it is really about us as statisticians thinking more about what, what we need to, to be concerned about. Uh, but I, I've, I've run out of ad-libbing, so <laughs> I, I, you, if, if, if you can make a start and Peter will come up with your yeah, slides okay. in a moment. <clears throat> okay, so I, th I think um, I can probably shorten my, my talk because many things have been uh, already explained by Helge or by Denise. So I will focus on a couple of points, but um, in order to 
uh, link to what Halgrimo has said. I think uh, the important uh, message is that there was a change, uh, a major change in a time at the, around 1990 because a system broke down, the Soviet system broke down, and the two statistical systems, they merged. It's 2022, yes, this one. Mm -hmm. And then the PowerPoint. That, no, I think no, this one. Yeah. <coughs> the, there was a, more or less a collapse of a system, and those who, are work, who were working <coughs> in the Soviet type uh, statistical system before, uh, they had to adopt uh, the more or less Western type. Uh, I believe. <clears throat> and I will come back to this, that we are nowadays living in a similar, let's say, time uh, where many, many things are changing, but it's not the collapsing of one system and the merging of two systems into one, but it's just the opposite, because our societies are split up into different uh, data worlds, I, as I will call it. Uh, the, the second point is <clears throat> uh, more or less linking up to what Denise has said, I personally believe um, that the question on ethics is very much and very closely linked to the questions of data literacy. What do we understand under data literacy or statistical literacy? And if we understand statistical literacy only <coughs> uh, to, to contain or to be based on knowledge and on skills, and if we do not add attitude uh, into it as a kind of standard, uh, then we fail um, and we, have, we, we educate a next generation of statisticians and data scientists in a too narrow and a too technical manner. And I think this is one of the problems that I, I can see. <clears throat> so there are, of course, also general ethics con considerations in, uh, in sciences, uh, which are procedural, extrinsic, and intrinsic. But um, I was only surprised to see how similar, uh, more or less, and how good our ethical principle could link into this. So my talk is firstly on, uh, will be on data worlds, then I will uh, talk a little bit about quality, responsibility and integrity, and briefly uh, go into the activities of the, um, the advisory board on ethics. Um, now, there was a famous uh, article of uh, William Davies at the very moment when Donald Trump was, uh, more became president of the US, January 2016. And um, he asked the question in The Guardian, how statistics lost their power and uh, what will happen if the data age replaces the statistical era. And the fear that he has expressed in his article is that with a kind of data world and a data logic, uh, everybody is able to construct aggregates and to produce <coughs> quasi and uh, statistical information. Uh, so we open the door for any kind of uh, um, popularism and interpretation, not guaranteeing uh, that we are using standard procedures like it is in statistics. Um, so basically what I ask myself very often is what is statistics? Um, so there is an uh, explanation by David Hand that I have quoted here. So what is statistics and who is a statistician? I think this becomes less and less obvious because we are split into different communities and the communication between these di different communities uh, becomes more and more uh, complicated. I don't know uh, if you know this, um, this, um, this YouTube video. There is a young uh, person, uh, that, that is the data scientist, and they are discussing with the elderly statistician what is the right way and what is the most attractive way to uh, use data, data-driven or um, let's say, uh, question-driven. So if, if you have not seen it, uh, it's really worth looking at it for a couple of minutes. My personal take is uh, that we are in a situation where on the one side, uh, on the left side, there is a kind of enthusiasm for the possibility which is um, more or less in, in the big data world, uh, using algorithms, using data sciences, everybody can do as like it is here in individual traffic. Politicians, and that's the real problem, believe, uh, and, and I quote David Cameron, 
a couple of years ago, uh, there was David Cameron, and he said, why do we need these bloody statisticians when we have data? So, and on the left side, uh, it's, it's really um, the, the individual traffic of data use, and on the right side, the other extreme end of the, this uh, scale is official statistics, really like the tracks of railway infrastructure, heavily standardized at international level. And I think um, if we forget to maintain and modernize uh, this infrastructure, then we will have a problem in a couple of years, as we have uh, seen in traffic. Um, and uh, often uh, I think um, the discussion is around deduction or induction. But I found this, uh, this uh, graph of this, uh, let's say, picture from George Box, 1976, where he says it's always deductive and inductive. So we start somewhere with the theory, then we apply it, then we learn, and so it's, um, it's up and down. But I think um, if, I, if I look at my students, they uh, really believe that you do not need to um, invest in models. Just take the data, use the algorithm, and then make a kind of prediction. And uh, search for the question that you um, have answered by uh, your, your uh, study. So um, there are many, many data worlds. If we look at the uh, producer side, so the stati statistical data science side, we, uh, I think we are now uh, in the world of academic statistics research and data sciences. It's very much based on uh, mathematical, so the uh, science and technology, so STEM in abbreviation. Whereas uh, on the various applications at micro and or macro level, so social applications and also business applications, uh, we normally should have a good knowledge of mathematics, computer sciences, informatics, but also of social sciences and humanities. <laughs> and this is very often missing uh, according to my experience and uh, management uh, as well. On the society, which is the user side, uh, we have also different data worlds. Uh, we have this kind of technocratic, the land of key performance indicators. Uh, everybody believes um, that management is only possible if you do it, measure, measuring, depending on evidence. Then we have a kind of critical society, uh, which is pro-evidence, but a little bit different. Uh, and the, the do-it-yourself statistics, this is the world of data science. Um, and then we have, of course, the post-truth politics, which are against evidence in that sense. So, um, alternative evidence. So, now coming to my um, conclusion, is that I think that, for me personally, it's um, one of the most important elements that students should, should understand is that facts are produced. They are not given. They are manufactured. And this has a, a very, very strong um, modest, uh, impact and consequence on whatever we do. Because we have to think about the design. Who designs um, the, this product, like an architect or like a product designer in the industry? <coughs> and who is uh, entitled to say um, what is measured in the program of official statistics? So the convention on the program is something which has a democratic importance. But this, for example, is not included in the fundamental principles nowadays. So the what? Um, so if we uh, look at this from this angle, uh, let me say facts are produ uh, products, uh, then they are designed and constructed. They shall be objective. And the question is how to do this, how to guarantee then we understand, okay, if they are products, then they have a product quality. Quality shall be codified and verified, the codification, uh, and the respect of the code. And finally, we should look at the social mandate and the license. Who is defining the mandate and who is giving the money and the, the laws? And uh, so who is behind? Which kind of democratic process is behind? So we have a responsibility, we have quality, and here I was searching for a, a kind of comprehensive word, a term, and I've called it integrity. 
This is a term which comes from the OECD in this regard. And uh, we have already heard that uh, we have a kind of ethical principle on the left side, this is the ISI um, guidance, and on the right side we have a family of fundamental principles, code of practices, and so forth, what uh, Heidelberg has explained. I will focus on um, some challenges and on the ethical part. Um, so, I think that um, in the board we have discussed um, an updated guidance on transparency, which is not yet, uh, let's say, sufficiently included in the ethical principles by now. If we are using artificial intelligence or so-called artificial intelligence, then transparency becomes more important. Uh, so, the increasing availability of digitized data, as we will probably call it found data, so to avoid the big data, found data, uh, which is a more generous uh, term, um, we will uh, probably propose a kind of modest change of the principles uh, for the um, conference in Ottawa next year. I will come back to this. Um, then um, we have ongoing uh, problems with integrity and in independence of statistics in various regions. Um, we have a couple of cases. Um, and then changes in the task and role of public statistics, Heidre Moore has explained. Possibly modest changes also of the fundamental principles. And for me, very important is the knowledge dissemination and application of ethical principles. We should promote them and uh, inject them, so to say, into the brains of students and younger, the younger generation. So quickly going through ethics, um, I think for me the catchword in the ethical, there are not principles, there are guidelines, as Denise has said, is responsibility. We, uh, as researchers, we as statisticians, as individuals, we bear a responsibility for um, the society, employers, colleagues, subjects. This is the, the wording of the, uh, of the declaration. And when, when we break down this responsibility, the ISI um, guidance distinguishes three types of values. The first is respect. We respect the privacy for, it, for others and the promises uh, of confidentiality given to them. There are more um, values in this breakdown. Professionalism. And the last is um, truthfulness and integrity. Now you might ask yourself, what on earth is truthfully, truthfulness and integrity? And now comes a little bit of a, a sentence that I would be happy to listen to Denise, why the principles then say, by truthfulness and integrity, we mean independence, objectivity and transparency. So this is for me not really, let's say, this is an equation with uh, five variables, two on the left side and three on the right side. Uh, it's, it's not really, for me, a satisfactory um, definition. But uh, let's see uh, whether we could find something better. Uh, then we have not 10 commandments, but 12 guiding compasses, so to say. Um, not uh, like in the UN fundamental principles, Pursuing objectivity, I will not go through all of them because they have, men, have, men, have been mentioned in the um, earlier sp uh, speeches. And um, this is the current composition of the advisory board. You see here that um, except uh, the Bernoulli Society, which unfortunately is not represented, the, all the members of the ISI family are in. And um, we are still searching for more uh, members from Africa and from, let's say, Latin America, which is uh, a little bit difficult. But we have a good composition um, of, um, let's say, different members and a very lively discu discuss discussion uh, for the time being. And uh, Hing Wang Fu is very proud to uh, be now a associate, if this is the right term, a member of of your committee. Uh, so, um, a very strong link between the two committees. Um, our work is uh, to prepare um, uh, statements on cases. I will come back to this. 
And then we have given us a program of work, uh, the review of the principles to promote literacy uh, in the sense that Denise has mentioned. Um, and for me personally very important that the profession called statistics or a statistician becomes more and more reflexive in the sense of thinking about what we are doing. What is statistics? And I think this should become a kind of integral part of our education systems, uh, really to understand what does it mean to be a, stat uh, a statistician. And this is the, my interpretation of the ethical guidelines. Um, and I think I'm quite close to what Denise has said. Um, so we have expressed a couple of statements throughout the last uh, year. You see Greece, Fiji, Turkey, El Salvador. Uh, you might ask yourself which countries are missing. Well, which countries are missing? There are some countries which are missing and I will come back to this in a minute. Um, the, we have a couple of uh, sessions prepared for the ISI next year in Ottawa. And we plan to also organize a workshop on the revision of the ISI Declaration of, Pro of Professional Ethics. Uh, Dennis Truin has uh, prepared with a small group uh, some really modest changes which uh, hopefully are able to um, uh, help us. Now, um, I go to the end. Let me see. This is, was already mentioned by um, uh, Halgrimur. In the IAOS, this is official statistics, there is a group called Krakow Group. And the Krakow Group uh, is chaired by Martin Buron and Jean Robert Susser. Um, and they really, are, in this group, we are discussing, Denise and I, we are in the group, also changes of the fundamental principles. Now, um, let me see. Now something else. Okay, here I shall stop. Verifying Microsoft Outlook. <laughs> okay, my last a couple of sentences only. You have seen that I have distinguished between ethics, quality governance, this is the institutional part, and what is missing for me in the fundamental principles is the integrity part. And this is the environment around an institution. So it's the state. Um, it is the discussion who decides on the program um, and so forth. And uh, it's, as Denise has said, also the question how could we look into countries where evidence gathering on the situation of statistics is difficult. And uh, here, let's say, our uh, colleagues in journalism, they have got something which is called the World Press Freedom Index. And you might ask yourself, why on earth do we statisticians not have a kind of statistics freedom integrity index? And this is uh, one of the sessions um, uh, uh, which was already included in the last ISI World Statistics Congress and one will come also in 2023 to discuss how possibly we could uh, organize a kind of free university, a statistical integrity index, mm -hmm. an indicator, or starting as the OECD does with a kind of self-assessment uh, where statisticians could go to our website and then assess their own, let's say, institutional uh, integral, uh, integrity uh, situation. That's it for myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. I, I was going to ask you something about the, what we often talk about, about serving the public good and whether that's what um, it, it fit, chimes with what you're hearing about integrity or whether um, in Britain we are using different words. I mean, you, you're doing a project now with this data. Mm -hmm. is, is, is the concept of public good being a, an aim of uh, the official statistics system something you would recognize there, or is it, are we talking in a different way about our vision? No, I think um, the project that we are doing in Germany is exactly on, let's say, the aim um, that official statistics, or in this case I would 
talk about public statistics instead so changing the words um, so that a citizen who receives or gets an information from a public provider of statistics can be uh, can trust that whoever is producing it follows uh, specific standards uh, and that also the program of work is decided in a democratic sound uh, manner so the mandate uh, the, the what is not decided in a kind of opaque way in the in the ministry but it is decided by the by the parliament i think here uh, what i as far as i know the uk system is ahead of us in germany uh, i would say uh, and therefore we are coming to london and uh, we are going to visit also the colleagues and learn what how does it work and how where are the problems oh, okay I, I think people from our user groups would say that some users needs are served better than others at the moment mm -hmm. here but um, yes I, I think that, that that's a problem we're, we're aware of uh, anyway you can see what I really want to do is ask uh, questions of all of the speakers uh, so d does anybody else ha have a, a question for Walter Yes, Denise? I struggle a little with the word objectivity because to me you're saying that it isn't facts, it's a construct of what you decide to collect. And then isn't it subjective? Isn't it what you decide is important? I just struggle a bit with this word objectivity. Um, I, prefer, I prefer transparency, openness, that methodology openness about the data so that other people can analyze the data and can come to different conclusions if they, mm -hmm. if they wish. Mm -hmm. um, So, so the question is whether objectivity uh, really reflects the constructed nature of statistics and what Walter has uh, uh, thought about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, 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 see, I see the point. Uh, maybe um, I have worked for too many years in official statistics uh, and uh, too few years in research. Uh, but um, I think objectivity in this sense is, is trying to e express that what we measure is determined um, in many ways and all the ways shall be transparent. Yes. But it, so transparency is, yeah. is, is clear, but transparency alone for me is not sufficient because if we decide on standards, on the what, uh, there was the question on the sustainable development goals, for example. Who has decided the sustainable development goals? The program of the 17, uh, 17 goals. Um, was this democratic? Was this... Um, let's say, uh, so I think uh, each and every statistical office has a program of work, uh, including the big indicators like GDP. Uh, is the GDP uh, something which is legitimized in a sufficient Way. Um, so it shall be objective and part of the objective is transparency and the other is the way the what and the how has been decided how the conventions have been found so, so you can see how badly we need to talk about this and really work through these mm -hmm. concepts but I want to assure you that we are making progress. And every time we do discuss these things, it becomes a bit clearer, but we really do need to keep having these conversations about what do we really mean by these concepts. So I'm gonna move on to uh, our, our next speaker now, and that is uh, John Pullinger. Um, and John has actually worked um, much closer to uh, politicians, but in the parliamentary sense, it, in that he's been a librarian in the, the, the House of Commons here, uh, and he's now chairing the Electoral Commission. Uh, but actually, of course, in between times, he's been national statistician uh, and our third former president <coughs> of the International uh, Association of Official Statistics. Um, so John is going to 
uh, talk about forging a new social contract for data. I mean, I, I think the, the lesson to learn from John is that um, he's learned from politicians how to come up with a snappy title. Uh, they, so I, I thought, yes, we must tell the media. So I hope John's got something exciting to say, an answer to this question about a new fo social contract for data. And um, I will uh, ask John to come speak. John, did you have a presentation? Or are you going to talk? Thank you very much, Tom. I mean, it's quite tricky coming forth because my mind's spinning with four immensely rich presentations. And we've heard Peter kind of telling us how we got here. Um, we've had Halgrimer and Denise reminding us of the amazing work of the official statistics community in coming up with the fundamental principles of official statistics and the ISI community in coming up with the de declaration of, on professional ethics. And then um, Volta has come up at the end um, just telling us in very straightforward terms that in the data world in which we live now, this is becoming increasingly important and we need to get a very, very solid grip on it. And when we're starting talking about ethics, can I just go back to, so we haven't really talked about the meaning of the word ethics here. I mean, ethics is about doing the right thing. It's associated with words like kind of morality um, and, and, and rightness, rightness of action. And as Jill, I'm pleased to see in the audience, and, and I both know in the um, statistics legislation in this country, um, which is made more interesting by our politicians, not just David Cameron, but the multitude of prime ministers we've had <laughs> since him. Um, the legislation in the UK just says that we are to provide a national evidence base that serves the public good. And it gives no further explanation. So, unfortunately, I inherited a lot of um, very well thought through practices and ideas from, from Jill and Steve and, and others who, who went before me. But I think I can genuinely say the most significant and important procedural innovation that took place during my time was the establishment of the National Statisticians Data Ethics Advisory Committee. Because that allowed us to bring in different voices to our conversations and to have the kinds of conversations that Denise illustrated so vividly that affect not just the outputs of what we do, but also the work of our interviewers in doorsteps. What is it right for them to ask people? What is it right for them to keep com confidential in often extremely challenging situations? It goes to the heart of all of our professional work. What is the public good? And how do we make some meaning of it? Because it's not an abstract question. It's a deeply practical question. It's a how we act today with this set of things in front of us. And it's also very contextual, and I think all the speakers in their examples have shown you can't actually write rules and as a result of looking at those rules find the answer. You have to discover the answer by having discussions and weighing up things which actually don't compute. And I think the discussion about the equation at the end and Walter's dissatisfaction with it, with it, with it was very much down to the fact that this isn't a topic that actually um, lends itself to solution by equation. It's a very human set of questions. It's a philosophical set of questions, but it's a deeply practical set of questions. So where does that take, take me in this, this, this conversation? Well, it's challenging enough to do that within the context of the UK. But I'm going to situate myself in the same way as the other speakers have so far in the more global context where the diversity of cultures, practices, needs, challenges is, is really different. And I was pleased we spent a lot of the first part of this conversation talking about what happened in 1989 and lead up to 1980 and, and beyond it. Because, I mean, I can remember some of those discussions, but I also remember the politics at the time. And the kind of hubristic, this is the end of history, the West has won, we have an answer to how we should live what is a good system of politics? What is a good system of development? And I guess what's happened since then is um, uh, the mighty having a fall after feeling they have solved the problem of, of human existence. Because 
there was a moment of hope, I think, there. Um, the now rather tarnished Washington consensus, there is a development model that will work for the whole world. If only people did this, everybody's lives would be better. And we went through a period, well, this is a 30-year period now, of kind of rediscovering that life ain't like that, and we need to be a little bit more um, open to diversity of, of, of culture. And Walter has highlighted that very clearly in his speech. So I come back to the story with Jane's question around the Sustainable Development Goals, because I think the interplay between the Sustainable Development Goals the ISI Direct Declaration on Professional Eti Ethics and the Fundamental Principles of Official Statistics is really profound for how we go forward as, as people across the world and as, as countries around the world um, in the future. Now, Jill and I were very fortunate um, because at the United Nations level, um, uh, the UK was chosen, or Jill was chosen, and I inherited the mantle of chairing the United Nations Statistical Commission at the time when the Sustainable Development Goals were being developed. And the tagline for the Sustainable Development Goals was, no one should be left behind. So by 2030, no one in the world should be left behind from human progress. And that was the driving force politically. And certainly, I, mean, I um, attended many sessions of the UN General Assembly. I spoke at four times at them, which was pretty surprising, really, given the way the General Assembly works, because they had realised we can't have a slogan that says no one is left behind unless we know whether no one is left behind. And how will we know whether no one is left behind if we don't have some system of measurement and a system of measurement that avoids the various pitfalls that have been highlighted here? As soon as you turn it into a target, it kind of collapses in front of you. So throughout the whole development of the SDGs was this idea there should be an indicator framework that sat underneath the SDGs. It wasn't really target driven. There's targets in the SDGs, but the statistical side of it is all about indicators. And we as a group of statisticians were very keen to, to, to stress this. They shouldn't give you answers. They should give you kind of diagnostics that enable you to have the discussions that we've talked about today and look at the trade-offs and particularly look at what is relevant and right for the situation that you are in. There was a lot of concern about landlocked countries, small island states, states that were very well developed, states that were not very well developed. This framework had to be robust to the very different needs and aspirations of people in those countries and backgrounds of people in those countries. The UN General Assembly debates were extremely noisy and incredibly colourful various indigenous populations coming to make sure their voice was heard, various advocacy groups of all kinds of, of minorities. How are we going to have a framework that enabled their human rights to be understood and addressed? What was the data that was going to give them voice? And that was a dominant, dominant um, uh, theme of it. And I can remember the, the, the week at the UN when the SDGs were adopted. All the leaders were in town. They were all very pleased with themselves. Um, and it was an incredibly positive moment. But in parallel with that, at the same time, a global partnership for sustainable development data was formed that had all of us as the data community coming together. So how will we develop a system that would enable us to work out what is going on? And as Walter has said, it's not just about official statistics, about all kinds of data, business data, citizen-generated data, found data of various kinds the emerging data from the Internet of Things, how do we mobilise all of this, particularly to give voice to minorities, but also to understand whether our development in the future is truly sustainable? Now, that has been juggling along. I mean, I've been involved with it on and off um, over those years. But the most interesting thing for me that I wanted to share with you today was some work the World Bank has done recently. So every year, the World Bank does a world development report. Um, and it looks at an aspect of development um, and shines a light on it with the hope that leaders around the world will pick it up and do something with it. Well, in 2021, which, as we will recall, was a quite interesting year given the pandemic and the way different countries are responding in very different ways to the pandemic, they decided to devote the entirety of the world development report to data. Um, and that became, um, the tagline was, a new social contract for data. So that comes from that report. And their conclusion was, we needed this new social contract 
if we were to particularly learn the lessons of the pandemic, but even more so and more profoundly to understand what was happening in the landscape of sustainable development data and give a kickstart to something which was otherwise stalling. So, I mean, I do commend the report. You can look World Development Report 2021. It's, it's, it's there and, and easily discoverable. Um, but the, the, the three elements of this social contract, I think, are, are very interesting. I mean, the first is the profound public good that data can be. And it only can be that if it is used. If there is data literacy, as, as others have highlighted, all of us feel that we are able to turn this data to our own use, to the use of our communities, the use of our countries, use it to trade off different interests, to have more sensible political debates. And the backdrop of the, uh, William Davis's article, he didn't post my response up there, Walter. I gave him a pretty firm saying, don't be so pessimistic, we can do better than this. Um, but we do face a massive challenge. But the first and most critical part of the challenge is create a climate where data can be used, which is about literacy. It's about us being good and not overclaiming. It's about politicians and decision makers more generally realising that they will make better decisions if they are well informed. The second element of the World Bank prospectus is about equity. Whenever you create a powerful new resource, it almost invariably helps the powerful more than it helps the powerless, unless you take action to think about equity, unless you particularly take action to promote literacy amongst the least empowered groups. And this was very evident at the UN, as I've said, by this diversity of voices, seeing the potential of it but often being the least able, really, to make the best of that potential. And then the third and final element of the World Bank prospectus was this safeguards from harm. And we've mentioned some of them, but I think for our community, they're ones we really should internalise and actually celebrate, and not this thing which is, I think, very prevalent amongst research communities. See, ethics is just another thing we've got to tick a box for and go on. This is the heart of our licence to operate and also the heart of what we should care about. We should care about the confidentiality of data that has been entrusted to us from citizens and businesses and, and others. We care about that above all. We should feel so frustrated. We will speak out whenever data are misused in some, some way by a politician, still worse by a member of our own community. And I think this is one place where the UK does have a particularly good track record with the Office for Statistical Regulation. Um, but also more generally with fact-checkers um, being very prevalent in our media and also organisations like Full Fact. But I think we should also think about misuse in terms of um, the way in which our own methods are potentially leading to false conclusions. The way in which we tolerate this kind of idea, lots of data must be better, so if, it's, if it weighs more, it must actually have more weight. And we should be absolutely furious when those things happen. So the new social contract for data is celebrating data as a public good, per se, stressing that it needs to be equitably managed and used across all communities. And thirdly, we really should speak up and insist on avoiding harm from data. If we do those things, we can create, and the World Bank's prospectus is an um, integrated system that connects together the various actors within government, yes, of course, but across the whole realm of academia, business communities, um, and particularly um, third sector organisations, charitable bodies, individuals, local communities, giving voice to their own concerns through better use of, of data. And that is the route to um, better development, a development that is ethical, and development that works for the different communities. Now, we've also talked about, well, can we start having an index for this? Well, we are starting to have an index, and I mean, you and I, Walter, were, were part of a parallel World Bank team creating a new statistical performance index. It is in its infancy, so Walter's right not to put too much of it onto a slide, but we've now got five years' worth of data, and it's quite instructive. First of all, it maps high levels of statistical performance on this index, map with high levels of human development, high levels of, of GDP, as measured by UN institutions. But the outliers are quite instructive. The outliers on the upside are countries that I think are globally recognised as having really invested in statistical infrastructure and thought about some of these issues. And some of them are quite surprising. Armenia, Poland, 
Mexico, Philippines. But within the global statistical community, those countries are celebrated. And they come off to the right. Countries to the left, China, because it fails hopelessly on openness. Iraq, because it's still relatively highly developed, but its infrastructure has been destroyed. Small island states, where it's almost impossible to do sample surveys of any meaning because there just aren't enough people. So you have to think of different ways of thinking about the data infrastructure in those countries rather than trying to import um, a, a system from somewhere where they do things differently because their countries are different. So we need to think more diversely about how we support those countries. So I think some of these indicators, and I guess my final letter, le lesson to us, if we're to behave ethically in this, we should start to apply our own techniques of measurement to ourselves to look at where we are doing well and where we are failing. And maybe that will be my fourth element of a new social contract for data. Thank you very much. Yeah, so, so you can see I hadn't heard about the World Bank report, and I know some of you subscribe to our newsletter that I, I send around, and this is basically the things I've heard of, and I'm quite conscious <laughs> that it's things mostly originating in organisations in London, mm -hmm. and actually I would like to be connected to more things because more people work on data, so I, I'll go and look that up, but if you feel there's something that you don't hear about, please do tell us about it, because... You know, do we, we have this terrible tracking system on our, on our emails, so I can see who, who opens this and the time that they open it. But <laughs> it's, it's, going to, it's going to lots of people who are really interested I in all of this. And we need to share this information because I don't think all of these different communities are, co are corresponding uh, well enough. And I, I think that's, that's what I would say about forging this social contract, is that the institutions need to think a bit harder about who they need to interact with and they push up and extract from down below and don't look across uh, as much as, as they need to. Um, but uh, if there are questions to John, we, we could take those. We, we, we should have finished uh, nearly 10 minutes ago, but are there questions to John? Uh, yes? Uh, I was thinking about the new social contract for data on transparency and a sense that perhaps the mass of people being studied shouldn't, shouldn't just be objects of study, but should, should be actively involved. And I wondered, well, was there an old social contract for um, data or statistics, or is it only now that we're starting to think actually there ought to be one uh, in that more democratic Yes. So, ha has the world changed, or have, uh, do we need to, to change with them? I think the world has changed, actually. I, I think when I started out in official statistics, there would be generally recognised amongst businesses and individuals, well, if I get an official form to fit in from statistics, I ought to fit it in. So there was this sense of kind of civic duty, which is much more fragmented now. And I think certainly within the official statistics world, there is a, a recognition where you can't just expect things to be given to you because you have a right to have it because you are this good thing. You have to give something back. And so a lot of, well, can we provide statistics back that are meaningful to that person or that community so that they can feel they are helped? It's much more, there's more mutuality. And I think that's a change in society. So that's speaking for the UK. I think in some other countries, I mean, we heard about the, the, what happened in the former Soviet countries. That there was just no trust in these kinds of ideas. And again, that, that is something that is changing more in some of, some of that, that, those countries than others. So I think you always have to be looking at, quite sensitively, what it is legitimate for you to do, because the public good is very much dependent on um, the norms of the society with which you're living. So there was one more, I think? No? OK, oh, ja Jane wants a question as well. No. OK, oh, well, well, we'll stop now and we'll reconvene at quarter past or whenever Peter thinks is appropriate. <laughs> but please go and have a, a cup of tea. Please talk to each other. It's really important that we talk about these things. It's really the main message because the language is hard and we don't really understand it or e e each other sometimes.
So pl please do take the opportunity to, to talk to people. Lovely. Thank you. OK, everybody, we are ready to restart. So uh, please take your seats. Thank you. I'm going to introduce you, if that's all right. OK, no, that's fine. Short in for Adikas in a long I used some notes last night just to hand to Tom about uh, e each of the speakers today. Uh, Tom said, well, you take over after the break, okay, I said. Uh, so I really, uh, I'm not going to look at my notes because our next speaker, um, I think I first met you, Felix, when you were a PhD student working for Professor Mary Gregory, is that correct? Uh, David Bell and Bob Hart. Uh, was it the new earnings survey panel data set that you were working on? So this was a, a really interesting data set where we realised, of course, that because the same, there was information collected in this more or less administrative survey on earnings, but on the same people every year. So if you had a national insurance number that entered in these two digits, you were automatically part of this data set, and nobody had ever really thought about, well, if it's the same person, we can link year on year, and it becomes a panel. And this was really exciting at the time. It was one of the first efforts at data linkage, made easy, of course, because it was all under the ownership of one government department. However, life has become complicated subsequently. Felix uh, has uh, a, a long involvement with uh, data management, data security, data protocols, and we thought it would be very interesting to bring him here because when you read through um, many parts of the world nowadays, when they're talking about data security, they use the reference, the five safes, and this has become more and more popular. Felix is the originator of the five safes, and I'm sure you'll be telling us a little bit about that. So, Felix, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, yes, I am going to talk a little bit about the five safes and about the history of them, um, but I'm going to widen it as well, talk about wider principles and accreditation and attitudes. Um, because Peter started off by saying, you know, how did we get here? Well, one thing is, here is not very good at the moment. It's a lot better than it used to be, there's a lot of areas we can improve in. And we're going to look at some of the areas where I think why we've got here, why we're still being held back, and where I think we can develop. So this is going to be looking back, but also looking a little bit forward, I hope. Right, so 15 minutes of fun. I'll try and keep it to time. Um, I'm going to talk about the five says, data governance, its history, why it's not good enough. And then I'm going to focus on some of the other areas which are surrounding that is, or become clear as a five says on its own, is not enough. So. For those of you who haven't come across this before, this is basically the idea. When we think about issues with data governance, and I'm interested in practical data governance, I spend quite a lot of time working with government organizations around the world particularly, um, helping them sort of manage their data access. We think of five different dimensions. So first of all, is this an appropriate use of the data? I'm gonna call that safe projects. How trustworthy are the users? And by that, I don't mean do I trust them not to walk on that, I trust them to be human. Um, have I trained them? Do I trust them to make mistakes? Can I be sure that they can't uh, they do something erroneously? Is that safe people? Does the environment present misuse? Safe settings? Is the data detail appropriate? That's the data itself. And is there a residual risk in published outputs? So, five things. We can consider them jointly and severally. The severally is really important for efficiency. I want to think about the ethics. I want to think about the project dimension. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that actually the people, the settings, all of that can be done. Okay, when I've thought about the ethics, I know that I can think about training my people, I can think about the environment, because all of that we know how to do. So I'm just going to focus on the ethics. That's the several bit. It makes it efficient to have arguments uh, within particular areas, but not to let everything be discussed at once. The jointly, it's when you put it all back together. 
So I've designed my system, my data access regime. Okay, are the assumptions I made about my users when I was designing my data environment, are they correct? Are they consistent? So we put all those together. That hopefully gives us our safe use. And the point about this is this is very general, so we can apply it in lots of different situations. So, for example, we think about public use files just for downloading. We have no idea whether people are, who's going to use it, what they're going to use it for, where they're going to store their data, what they're going to say about this. The only thing we can do is focus on the data itself and make that anonymous, truly anonymous. Okay, we think about secure research services. Okay, so there we got loads of controls about the projects, about the people coming in, about the environment. We even do output checking to make sure that every output that's produced has no disclosure risk. So that means that basically we can do minimal effect changes to the data. You know, all we do is literally remove the stuff which has no statistical value, like names and addresses, for example. And then thinking about things like scientific use files, where you can, for example, download from the data archive. But we do get people to say what they're going to use them for, and we do ask people to be registered users, and we give them guidance on how to store their data. Don't put it on a USB stick. And we tell them there is information about how to do the output checking, but we're not sure that many people read this stuff, and we're not sure that many people do this. We know that this does have an effect, but it's not the same as when we're asking people to work in a controlled environment. So for those ones, because we have some other controls, but not ones we're very sure about, we're gonna put a bit more of the effort into protecting the data. So the data is better than it is for public use, where we have no controls at all, but it's still not as good as in the, the secure service, but that's fine, because that's what we're balancing out, different projects, uh, different access regimes for different uses. So, um, came up and, and I'll give you a date, um, January 2003. Um, the reason I know this is because there was a, an ONS executive board meeting where I had to present the idea and this is where it came up for. Um, there were only four safes at the time, there was no safe data because I was designing this for a secure environment. Um, by around 2007 we had all five because I started writing about this as more generally how we could explain ONS's general uh, data strategy in there. Um, when I left ONS in 2012, um, didn't want to call it the VML security model anymore because that was the thing we'd set up. Uh, and then I came across a search by a Kiwi researcher for Felix Ritchie Five Saves, and I thought that's a much better name. Um, so that's where it came from. So, so thank you to the New Zealanders for that, for the name. Um, and this little graph at the bottom, you can just sort of see um, no references to this in 2012-13 in any academic papers. 2014, it's probably just me, um, but the number of references to this has been growing steadily, particularly in the last couple of years, and this is just academic references. Um, in government references, there's an awful lot more now. Because in terms of usage, if you're in the UK and you're working with health and social data, this is the governance framework that you will be using. So UKRI, much of central government, the devolved governments, UK Data Archive, Health Data Research, Health Foundation, Cancer Research UK, they're all using this framework to structure all their data security questions. And you might get asked by an organization, say, well, actually, can you make sure, you know, what are the five safes of your data management plan? Internationally, New Zealand, uh, Australia, it's all over there. Canada is using it more. Um, France, Germany, Norway, Eurostat in various levels uh, use this. Um, in the Non-Census Bureau US, it's growing as well and in LMICs, uh, low and middle income countries, because we now, with my colleagues, we run some data governance training programs. So, why is it grown? First thing is, I think probably because it's simple. There's only five things to remember, five words. Um, I know you have your 10 uh, categories for the official principles, but, but we've got five words and it's much easier to remember. Um, it's comprehensive because you can fit everything into it. Um, Perhaps with a bit of wrangling, you know, if you want to think about your post-project data curation, where does that fit in? I tend to put it in the projects, maybe it should go elsewhere. But the fact that we're thinking about this, that's the important thing. You're almost sort of saying, well, if you want to put in structure, where are you thinking about this? Um, it's flexible, doesn't tell you how to do anything. And what it does is it helps you to structure your thinking. And that was exactly what it's designed to do. So that when we have the lawyers and the IT people and the statisticians and uh, ethicists all arguing over things, that, okay, this is the structure that will allow us to have that argument. Don't mind what you come, conclusion you come to, but this will help you get to that conclusion. And lastly, it's easy to explain. So even organizations which don't use the five safes in planning and structure, 
quite often use it in their training because it's a really handy way to structure things for non-specialist researchers. Um, last thing is because it's common. Um, this is one of the things that I think over the last few years has really made the difference. Growth has just uh, increased dramatically and one of the reasons is because other people are using it. Um, I've worked in government now for 20 years and one of the most important things to get someone to do something is say, well, someone else has done it first. That, that's a really strong argument for, for doing anything. Okay, um, so that then leads to a couple of problems with it. So the first problem, over-interpretation. It is just a framework. This is how you can think about things. It doesn't tell you how to do anything. Um, a number of organizations in the UK use the thing, your, your project proposal must be 5 says compliant. That means nothing. Um, here you go, how about this for 5 says compliant? I think this is a good idea. I'm only gonna share the data with my mates. I'm gonna keep it all at home because the kids aren't interested. I can't find anyone I know in the data. And will I need to produce statistics anyway? Well, that's 5 safes compliant. You've thought about all things. Um, but I'm not gonna give you the data and possibly shouldn't let you out of the house without a chaperone. Um, so, second issue leading on to this is the flexibility. It's designed to let you think and help a talk about situations, but as a result of that, it doesn't give you particular guidelines to design an efficient, effective access regime. So there are lots of specific solutions around there. You know, there are standards, there's loads of evidence of good practice for all of those around the world. Um, there's a group in Australia called Cadre developing some really, really good guidelines, but they are sort of add-ons to that. And that doesn't tell us specifically how we make our decisions. And this is one of the things which we're now going to focus on because this, I think, is where uh, I'm saying that there's a long way still to go. This is where we need to think about where we're going. So, two things to think about in here. First of all, principles-based thinking. Okay. When we think about regulation regimes, okay, we can think either rules-based regimes or principles-based. So rules-based regimes in the law itself, it tells you what you should be doing. It gives you the standards, gives you the criteria. Uh, and the law is a source of enforcement. So for example, European financial regulation is pretty much rules-based, says what you can and can't do. Principles-based models tell you more about what you're trying to achieve. And then typically you will use things like accreditation to actually make sure you do that. So for example, Anglo-Saxon financial regulation is much more based around uh, uh, a principles-based approach. Um, that's not the best argument I know because we don't necessarily have a good reputation in financial regulation here, but for example, in something like the um, UK Digital Economy Act, um, that is principles-based because what it says is we need to make sure the data can be made available to people, it should be used, and then it goes through, ironically, using the five says, we should have an accredited processor, there should be an accredited training program, there should be an, a, a system for actually checking the outputs, there should be a system for approving the projects. Doesn't do anything about the data. So that's the principles-based approach. And increasingly within data governance, this is being seen as better in practice um, because there is lack of clarity sometimes because you don't say exactly in the law what you have to do, but it gives you all that flexibility. So think about this on a personal basis or more specific basis when you're thinking about this. If we're trying to run a principles-based governance system, what we're focusing on is what are we trying to achieve? What are the outcomes and what are the operational goals? For example, one of the things we recommend is when you look at outputs, you use a system called principles-based output checking. What we're trying to achieve, the principle is we want the maximum amount of outputs in the fastest possible time with a level of security that we're very comfortable with. And what we also need to think about is we need to make sure that this is a system that the researchers will work with. That second principle is really important. If you get a system that researchers don't work with, you're already in trouble. You can also think about what's important on here. Now, this way of thinking about things requires effort, but it does give us more efficient, more sustainable solutions on here. Because you think about this, you have an idea of what you're trying to achieve, you have the practical implementation. If things change, for example, the laws change, you can change your implementation. Now, you don't have to change your principles as part of that. But again, that in itself is still not enough. What we also need to think about is our personal institutional attitudes on here. Okay, so traditionally, we thought about things about being very careful, don't do anything unless it's, you're certain about this, think about worst cases all the time, it's all about protecting the data. This is not a very good solution for managing data. 
Um, more effective is something we call the EDRU model. Um, I'm going to talk through this very quickly. But essentially, four elements. This first thing is evidence-based. Um, traditionally, we might have thought, what if? What if? Can I release this data? What if my neighbor finds out? What if the only identifiable person in this data set is the editor of the Daily Mail? These are all the things. They're hypotheticals. It doesn't take you very far, because there is always a hypothetical which you can't respond to. What we should be thinking about is, what does the evidence show? Because we know lots. We know lots about people, we know lots about manage things, we know how to organize things, we know where lots of the risks are, so let's use that, not go down the what if. Second thing is default open. Can we, should we do this, are we allowed to do this? Again, let's turn that round. This is where I want to be, how do I get there? If I ask that question, I will typically come up with a very different set of answers from saying, should I be moving in the first place? Okay, so let's move that from can we, should we, to how do we do this best. Okay? And that gives us a much better sense of use of the data is the objective. Where do we want to be? How do we get there? Okay? And that's because maintaining confidentiality is a constraint. Okay? Uh, third thing is are for risk managed. About once a year, someone will come up and tell me this when I'm advising them, saying, I want to be sure that we've minimized the risk. No, you don't. Okay, if you want to minimize the risk, you get your data, you put it in a box, you hide it in a doubt, says Lou, and put a sign on the door saying, beware of the leopard. Works for planning instructions as well. Um, what we want is something more sensible. There are risks, there are benefits. Particularly if you want to look at the whole public benefit, there are risks from not using that data as well. What happens if you don't allow your information to be used to look at a new medical procedure and people die from that? Well, if you're just the data owner, maybe it's not part of your risk set, but if you're looking at the wider public benefit, you must consider this. So we need to think about risks versus benefits in a consistent way. And last one, you user-centered. You know, typically, we thought about how do we protect this data. Let's go the other way around. What do users need? What will they tolerate to get this? If this is going to be really useful data, really sensitive, okay, do I think the users will come and work in a restricted environment to use that? If they do, Great, we can build on that. If they won't, we'll have to think of something else. But again, what we can be clear on that is this is where we're determining the benefit and also determine the success of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the process as well because we can think about actually we can design something specifically for this group. So, bring this all together. How do we want to think about things? Okay, uh, how are we going to tackle governance? That's where our attitudes come in. You know, what's my approach going to be to the problem? What are you trying to achieve? Those are where our principles are coming in. Okay, so we know what my value is. Okay, these are my specific principles in this. What are the things I want to control? Okay, there's my five safes. There's my structure for starting to discuss this. Okay, we have standards. Okay, what are the standards? Are there any standards in this area? And lastly, solutions. As I say, everything we want to do has already been done by someone somewhere. The only question is, is it appropriate for you and can you do it better? However, there's a lot of difference in how much we know about these. So, solutions, I say everywhere there are lots of, lots of great solutions we can learn from. Standards, for some things, you know, for example, technical standards, um, for things like how we might run ethics committees, it's important. Uh, the five safes, that's becoming common, it's a useful, handy language. Principles, becoming common in law, don't see so much discussion about, you know, sort of first principles when looking at data access solution. I usually have to wrestle people to get there. And as for discussions about our attitudes, that's as rare as hen's teeth. So, um, so summary. We need to sort out goals, assuming everything is possible. Focus on the objectives rather than consent, constraints. Look at the principles, not the historical precedent. Using structures to frame thinking. We have made progress toward that. I say it's a lot better world than it was 20 years ago, and it's a lot better world than it was five years ago, and we are making a lot of improvements forward but there's still quite a long way to go on here. Okay, that's it. Well, questions for Felix. Uh, it's quite a lot. Jane. Uh, that's brilliant. That's really, really helpful. I'd like to use it. Uh, my, my experience has been, and um, this goes all the way up to the financial regulation of Parliament and Ombudsman, their attitude is risk is everything. We mustn't have any risks. Um, and so we get told that if we don't have a departmental barbecue, 
how do we make sure that everybody has learned that fire is hot? Um, what progress, you, you said you could work with lawyers with this. Do they, are they actually genuinely willing not to just go into, does allow anything to happen? I mean, how, uh, do you find them a major barrier? Because I find them a major barrier. So they know about, about things like um, working with lawyers and groups, yeah? yeah. Okay, um, so example, first thing, when I started at ONS <coughs> to make access to this data available, I was told, go and talk to the lawyers. Uh, and the data is governed by the Statistics of Trade Act. And so I went and talked to the lawyers, and they said, look, it's clear, this cannot be made available to academics. It's there in black and white. This data can be made available to government researchers, uh, to government uh, members of government. Okay, so I went away and thought about this for a couple of days, and then I went back to Laura and said, okay, can we make academics government people for the purposes of access to this data? And they said, oh, well, you could do it this way, or this way, or this way. So, the most important thing is how you ask that question really matters. I like working with lawyers. Where people usually go wrong is because they don't ask the lawyers to do their job. They ask them to do their own job. So, um, and, but what that I mean is someone says, okay, I'm not sure what to do. I'll go and ask a lawyer and say, what, what should I do about this? Okay, whereas I learned, the thing is, you go and say, this is what I'm going to do. How do you help me do it lawfully? Uh, and that's the more effective solution. What's really important, though, is you get in there and set the terms of reference straight away. So we had uh, we applied for remote access to ONS's secure facility in 2020. Um, they sent through the contract, um, the agreement on there, lots of detail about what we can and can't do. Um, and the people who received it immediately sent to UE's legal team uh, and said, can you have an opinion on this? Um, I've not done this, but of course, the legal team just get this. There's no context, no idea about what it, it, what it sits in. They came back with a whole load of things and said, this looks terrible. It's all about stuff and all risk and responsibilities. And, and then I had to spend, write a two-page article for, our, for our, our, our executive explaining exactly why, yes, it does make all these things responsible for these things, but at the moment, you have a massive hold in your security. This is much, much better. So we had to spend a lot of time rowing back from that. So getting those early conversations in, having discussions, particularly on one-to-one, -one, and really setting the context. Um, lawyers are great when you ask them to do their job. They're not helpful if you ask them to do your job, because they will come back to, to what's their default position. Yes. Can I ask, to take you back to what you felt appropriate use of the data meant? Because as someone who's in the private sector, it often seems to me that appropriate use is determined to be academics are good, government departments are good, private sector is bad. Um, I, I don't think that's how it should be interpreted, but you know, I could give you a very, very long list of bodies that interpret it that way. Okay, it's so a question about what is, is appropriate use and, and do we get the idea that private, private sector is, is less worthy of being given access to the data than others? Um, the answer is no. Uh, I mean, there, there should be no difference and the sorts of facilities that I support, there isn't any difference. In fact, one of the things we do is when we, we train people how to do output checking, one of the exercises we do is to get them to think about the types of users that come through. Um, they say, well, basically, civil servants are really good at following the rules uh, academics are really good at the technical stuff, but perhaps not so good at following the rules. They really like the private sector economic consultancies because they, they tend to, A, be technically good, and B, they follow the rules because this is their bread and butter. However, there is an issue about, you know, uh, uh, about the way things are perceived because it can be perceived that, for example, you might have different incentives uh, to misuse data. Now, whether that perception is accurate or not, I wouldn't say, I would say you need to go back to a specific case and say, okay, what are your concerns in this area and what are your concerns about people can do with this information? So that's why when we look at things like the Secure Research Service, I think generally the private sector consultants have a pretty good reputation in there because they're expert and they do what they're told. Um, they have the combination of the two. Um, and within the Secure Research Service, we're very uh, comfortable that actually this is a, a, a very solid, efficient arrangement which is in no one's interest to, to, to risk. Um, if you start thinking about data which may be available under different regimes, maybe you can make a case as to whether people might want to misuse it for other, other purposes. But again, you need to think about well, what would other people be doing? So when you download stuff from the data archive, 
you are supposed to keep it for a particular period and then delete it. I'm pretty sure no one has ever audited universities to find out whether people are actually downloading stuff and then deleting it afterwards because it's not malicious, it's just the sort of things that people do. So I think uh, in terms of the user groups, no, you should be thinking about actually what do we want to achieve? Again, go back to our principles. What do we want to achieve? Okay, that's fine. What do we think is an evidence-based risk assessment? Okay, if we're going to say that private sector people are higher risk, okay, what's the basis for that? Okay, is there something about, for example, on this particular data set there might be higher um, risk associated with it? Um, or maybe there isn't. Now we know that there are certain data sets where, for example, um, there is a potential strong commercial incentive to use things. And you might argue that in certain cases then there might be concerns about a particular individual organization having ac access to this data set. So you can make cases in particular for that. Um, so each one will go through an assessment. But in terms of the general principle, no, this is what you're trying to say. Someone who meets these criteria is a safe user. It's only in that particular case you say, okay, what's the particular case that you can decide whether this is appropriate or not? And sometimes there might be differences between different groups. I mean, we still have differences between private and government users. Thank you very much. I think we need to move on if we're to finish on time. Our uh, next speaker, final speaker, before we break for a panel discussion, uh, I met him first when he was with ONS, I think before you were Director General. Um, at that time I was working mainly for ESRC and uh, we used to have uh, lots of discussions, I wouldn't say arguments, but they came pretty close to arguments at times about money and about resources and about the role of academic researchers versus official statisticians. And Stephen was always the voice of moderation in those discussions. So Stephen, we're very welcome to have you here. The title of his talk is Governance and Trust, Where Do We Go From Here? Well, thanks, Peter, for that. I've, the voice of moderation, well, there we are. Um, I'll see if I can live up to that. And thanks very much for inviting me to this important session and also the opportunity to meet up with people um, from over the years. I'm going to turn the discussion a little bit towards the relationship between governance and trust. I don't have any slides, so you don't have to worry about me not clicking the clicker at the right time and things like that. And also a bit about how trust can be undermined by misuse of statistics. And finally, some suggestions on how we might move forward. I remember when I worked in the ONS, and this was a bit earlier than you were talking about, uh, Peter, and was having a discussion with a Treasury colleague. This was before the Statistics and Registration Services Act when the ONS still reported to the Treasury. And we were discussing public trust in official statistics, which was a, a subject of debate then as it is now. And I was arguing the case for professional independence of the ONS and a robust governance framework. And he was saying, well, well, Stephen, no one really cares about, uh, about, about governance. Um, all people want is good quality statistics. You know, if ONS delivers quality, trust follows. And in a sense, we are both right. Um, public trust depends on both quality, good quality, and also on good governance. But it's probably also the case that users are more interested in quality, while we statisticians are perhaps more interested in governance, and maybe not many other people are. But it is important, and I just want to say a few words about why I think it's important. Governance, I suppose, is the way in which people interact with each other to bring some kind of order or direction over a social system, in this case, a, a statistical system. As we've seen, it's made up of laws, principles, codes, and also the norms and cultures in which official statisticians work. So in the UK, the Stat Statistics and Registration Services Act, the Code of Practice for Statistics, together with what we've heard, the UN Fundamental Principles and the ISI Declaration, together with the policies and guidance of the government statistical service, all add up to a very strong governance system, with much of it being codified and written down. Equally important is the supporting culture based on a set of clearly expressed values. But it wasn't always like this, and prior to 2007, when the new act came in, as, as people have said, only 15 years ago, UK statistics legislation was, was rather patchy. And at this stage, I just want to pay tribute to Tim Holt, who passed away only a week or so ago, 
who um, uh, was first director of the ONS, and I, I worked for him at the time, because he did very much in a very difficult climate to pave the way for the legislation that followed. So what does good governance provide which adds to trust? Well, good governance demonstrates an ability and willingness to act in the best interests of statistics and the users of statistics by ensuring the operation of effective, open and ethical processes which adhere to the law and stand up to scrutiny. It enables and supports compliance with the law and relevant regulations, and all this enhances trust. And trust is important because it's the foundation upon which the legitimacy of democratic institutions rest. Trust in statistics leads to trust in the public policies based on these statistics, policies that often depend on behavioural responses from the public for their success. So for me, good governance based on open and ethical processes laid down in regulation and legislation is the key foundation of, of trust in statistics. But of course, trust does also depend on statistical quality, and in particular, easy access, good analysis and presentation, and access to methodological material. What's especially important is that statistics are seen in a relevant context so that the public recognise the statistics as being relevant to them. So do we have a crisis of trust in statistics? Well, not directly for official statistics, I don't think, at least not in the UK, where we have a strong governance system well supported by legislation. However, I agree with Walter that we're re we are reaching a similar tipping point to the, the point that was reached in 1990, and also John made reference to this as well. Because misuse of any statistics leads to a lack of public trust in official statistics. Statistical offices can be producing the highest quality statistics with the best analysis and the clearest interpretation, but members of the public don't differentiate between statistics produced by an official agency such as the ONS and other statistics quoted in the media. So official st statisticians, and there's many of us here in the audience today, must be concerned about the lack of trust in statistics generally, not only of the trust in their own statistics. The question of trust in statistics and misuse are of concern to statisticians worldwide. Walter has already made reference to the Krakow Group in the IOS conference earlier this year, and there's details of that on their website, and I'm sure that will be discussed further at the next IOS conference in April in Zambia. And I'm organising a session on statistics and false facts at the next World Statistics Congress in Ottawa in July. So it is very much an international issue. The last global self-assessment of compliance with the UN fundamental principles took place in 2019, and over three quarters of countries reported that their statistics offices had reacted to the erroneous interpretation and misuse of statistics during the previous five years. One third of st statistics offices had done so more than twice a year. The most commonly identified type of misuse was the misreporting of findings, but other issues included overgeneralizations, selective reporting, and suggestions of false, false causality. The UN has tried to help countries abide by its fundamental principles by publishing implementation guidelines, and I was part of a group which drafted a supplementary chapter to this, setting out a maturity model approach to self-assessment with case studies with the aim of tightening up compliance, and the UN is due to start a, no a new round of self-assessment in, in the next couple of years. Now, misuse can be intentional or it can be accidental. And let me comment first on accidental misuse. This occurs when users don't have sufficient knowledge of the statistics they're using or sufficient expertise. And the level of statistical literacy is poor. A 2018 study showed that most people cannot apply a percentage growth rate or read a graph accurately. How many people understand the difference between the RPI and the CPI? or can explain the triple lock. We do reply, rely on intermediaries, the press and broadcast media and commentators to interpret statistics for the public. Now the remedy for this, as I see it, is twofold, and official statisticians, I think, have a role in both of these. One is to continue to make statistics easier to access and understand through better presentation, visualization, and commentary. Avoiding publishing statistics which seem to measure the same thing. And the second, as has been mentioned already, is through statistical literacy, 
through educating the public, but also expert users, commentators and the media about the statistics they use so as to minimise the possibility of misinterpretation. Of course, good statistics offices, such as we have in the UK, do these things, and the RSS has run training sessions for journalists and politicians. But it's worth em emphasising the importance of this work and the impact that it could have on reducing accidental misuse. I should also make reference to the International Statistical Literacy Project, which has a repository of international resources online. We also need to recognise the more interaction there is between producers and users of statistics, the less likely users will misuse them. But not all misuse of statistics is accidental. Statistics are sometimes deliberately misused or misinterpreted by campaigners wanting to strengthen their arguments. Maybe that's a sign of the importance that they attach to having fact-based arguments. And we all recognise the importance of fact-checking organisations such as Full Fact and the work that the BBC does. Now in the UK, we're particularly fortunate that Section 8 of the Statistics and Registration Services Act allows the UK Statistics Authority to publish any concerns it has on the quality of statistics or on good practice. And Section 27 requires the authority to report to Parliament. And the authority exercises these functions through the Office for Statistics Regulation. And Ed Humpherson regularly writes to ministers and others to draw their attention to statistical abuses. And I don't know of any other country where the statistics agency is as active as the UK is in calling out the misuse of statistics. So how can we work better internationally to, produce, to improve trust in statistics? Hal Grimmer has spoken about the UN fundamental principles. They set out the requirements for good governance of official statistics and have been endorsed by all governments at the UN General Assembly. And as he said, principle four entitles agencies to comment on the misuse of statistics. And as he said, the principles have stood the test of time well. There are issues with compliance, but the main problem is not with official statistics, it's with other data and statistics that circulate. It's not difficult for campaigning organisations to develop statistics and data which have no basis in fact, and to use these in public debate where they have an impact on decision making. So where do we go from here? I've just got some suggestions in conclusion. And I think in the UK, we have to build on the strengths we already have. So that's for official statisticians to continue to focus on making statistics simple to understand and access and to minimize the possibility of misuse. Similarly, for the RSS and others to actively pursue the advance of statistical literacy, particularly through programs such as the Statistics for Journalists courses and briefings for parliamentarians. We should continue to speak out against misuse, but not just the Office for Statistics Regulation, but also broaden the range of those others who will speak out uh, in this cause. And this could involve building stronger links between official statisticians and fact checkers and the media. Maybe we also look to, ought to look at the online safety bill, which is due to return to Parliament next month. This bill makes it an offence to send a message that a person knows to be false, where that message would cause harm. And of course, that is a bill all about personal safety. Um, but misuse of statistics also poses a threat to our society. Um, and might, this might prove to be a useful way to raise the issue. But could we look more radically internationally? Does the scope of the fundamental principles need to be broadened to become fundamental principles of statistics and data used in public debate or to inform public decisions? What might these look like? Would they be very different from the ones we currently have? And how would we get societal con consensus on these to get agreement? And who would own them? I doubt whether the UN would. But there is merit in exploring a wider set of principles that are more relevant to current concerns. These principles might be developed from the existing fundamental principles, but it might be more helpful to do some initial work unconstrained by these. Working internationally to build a consensus for an international code that applies to all statistics and users is something we should all consider. Thanks very much. Well, well thank you very much, Stephen. There was a, a, short, a short presentation, but there was a lot in there. So uh, do you have any questions for Stephen, on, particularly on his thoughts on where do we go from here? Tom. Um, so you, you finished with this idea about communication uh, bits of what once, once we talk about communicating, it's not just government statisticians communicating, it's a broader community that's not just statisticians, it's mathematicians more broadly. And, and, the, and how, we, would you agree that we need to work more widely and actually? How, how 
Yes, you're right. It goes wider than statisticians. I mean, the whole, it's all about society taking some kind of sense of responsibility for, for data and uh, for the way in which the data are discussed publicly. And I think that means joining with other professions, but also wider than that as well. Um, so certainly the media and fact-checking organisations. But essentially it's about seeing that you can't really put these things in pigeonholes anymore. You can't simply say, well, official statistics, okay, it's got the fundamental principles, that's okay, that's fine, let's walk away from the debate, because the debate is a, is a lot wider than that. And what I'm really saying is that I think official statisticians have a contribution to make to this debate, even though it's not entirely their issue. I think this comes back um, to um, Denise, was it you who was giving a lecture on ethics and you had one student turn up? I think that there is this kind of question, isn't there, about right, we, we, I think, would believe that rights and responsibilities are kind of like two sides of the same coin and they go together, but maybe that's a slightly old-fashioned concept and maybe that isn't something that people kind of think about these days. But I would say that certainly, you know, yes, okay, so you think you have rights, but that there are responsibilities that come with that too. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Before we move on to the panel, uh, a couple of uh, things I want to address. First of all, Denise, would you like to come up and say a few words? Peter suggested that I might just say a few words about Tim Holt, but Stephen has already um, uh, started this discussion. Many of us um, knew Tim very well, and considered him to be a friend, as well as having huge respect for his intellect and what he achieved in his statistical career. Um, and I like to think that, uh, that many of us were influenced by him. Um, his contribution as an academic was immense. Um, I first got to know him when he was uh, an academic in Southampton University and um, I was very young and he was relatively young but I thought of him as being a huge mentor and uh, he was an amazing person to discuss statistical issues and ethical issues with. Um, and of course he also contributed through, as we've heard through his work in the Government Statistical Service and in Statistics Canada, and I've had messages this last week or so since he died from Ivan Felagy, um, who said how important he was in the early day, days of Statistics Canada's discussions about um, ethics. He was also president of the society um, and whilst he was president, he fought very hard for building the trust in the statistical system. Um, and I remember having discussions with him about this balance between the, the trust in statistics and trustworthiness of statistics. So I think many of us are finding this last 10 days since he died quite difficult um, because he was so important to us. Um, in a professional capacity, but also in a personal capacity. And I just wanted us to reflect on that and think, I mean, one of the, one of the wonderful things about having discussions about ethics is you think about how important people are and why we're here. He never lost sight as to why we we're here. And I think it's great that we've got Hal Gumir and Volta because he influenced you too. Um, so he wasn't just about influencing within the UK, he was influencing us internationally. And uh, I just want to say thank you for what he contributed. And um, I feel 
I'm a better person for having known, known him. And I think quite a lot of you must feel the same. So when Tom and I were thinking about the work of the uh, data ethics and governance section, uh, clearly um, we had to establish a number of events. Uh, and we've been working hard on this over the first year of operation as a section within the uh, RSS. And of course previously as a special interest group. And it became clear to me that one thing we needed to do was to kind of look back, look at where we are now, and look forward in terms of uh, data, ethics, and governance. If I could rename this section, I think I would now call it data governance and ethics, rather than data ethics and governance. It makes it sound like there's something about data which has to be ethical, but that's not the case. It's about the way in which we interact, the way in which we use what we're doing with data and so on. And I think that's come across very clearly in all of the presentations today. So uh, I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers. But before that, I'm going to invite Andrew, who is, are you president elect or now president, Andrew? Is it elect. Yeah, president so, elect yeah. of the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, so congratulations. congratulations. I'm very pleased that uh, that's happened. And, and Carly Kind from the Ada Lovelace Institute. So, which of you two would like to go first? Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I feel very much a fish out of water because I'm not a statistician, and you may not all be aware of it, but it's quite an intimidating crowd, um, <laughs> particularly with you know so many um, very accomplished people having spoken today, and it was a really wonderful selection of speakers. Um, I, I'll just pull out a couple of threads that um, occurred to me while listening to the speeches. But I suppose for background, um, I, I'm a lawyer by background um, and I run the Ada Lovelace Institute. We are a research institute established by the Nuffield Foundation and we have a remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And the RSS was a key actor in the establishment of the Ada Lovelace Institute and indeed our Deputy Chair Heaton Shah was then CEO of the RSS when ADA was established in 2018. And we very much are born out of this movement of thinking about data ethics and what is it and what should we do about it. Um, but when ADA was established there was a big question um, on our shoulders which is how do you research these things? What is the contribution that a dedicated research institute makes to thinking about research ethics in, oh, sorry, we think about ethics and rights and values in the context of data and AI and new technologies. And, um, I, you know, we've tried lots of things and experimented um, as we've found our feet as an institute. We're 20, 25 people now and we're an interdisciplinary mix of lawyers, philosophers, social scientists and uh, techies. And um, we, our growth has mapped to the growth of the space and the changing nature of conversation about data ethics. Um, and AI ethics and everything that that encapsulates from kind of large language models and their implications for art and culture and social media to um, these more infrastructural questions around data governance, regulation, regulation of artificial intelligence, etc. And I think a key finding for us and what has now become a big core part of our offering is in the de tech and data space, um, there is no such thing as one ethics. And this question that came up a few times of um, who has the right to be to say or how, to define the problem space around data ethics is very um, very central to our thinking about data and technology. One word I didn't hear today at all. I thought I wasn't going to hear AI. I thought statisticians don't like to talk about AI, but I did hear. I think how to say it in the end. But um, I didn't hear the word power, or at least I didn't hear it very much. And and that's a contrast, I think, to other spaces that talk about data and technology, in which power comes up a lot because one thing that technology is doing is that it's reordering power across society in so many different ways. It's upending power structures, and it's disempowering lots of people. And um, uh, I think um, ethics, in my mind, is really connected to this question of power and who gets to say what is measured, what is gathered, um, and what can be learned from it. And there is a real kind of reckoning or revolution going on in that. So as an institute in that space, in that kind of messy place of understanding 
um, who should have the power to say um, uh, how data benefits people, who should have the power to define what a harm is. I think that is something historically we've had a limited view of what harms might be arising from data, but equally we may have had a limited view of what benefit might be and who gets to define what benefit and to whom um, uh, is a really big important questions. And so I think it was in your um, first in introduction, Peter, you talked about um, the considerations for ethics committees being harm on the one hand, benefit on the other, and then public participation. And I think where we've come down is thinking that um, understanding what ethics means in this space is about building in participation from as diverse a group of stakeholders as possible and um, asking as many people from as many perspectives as possible, what do you consider societal benefit? What do you consider harm? How would you like to see data governed and used best in your interest? Is the best contribution we can make at the moment to this data ethics space. So a lot of the work we've done is around participatory data governance or bringing together members of the public to say, how do you want your data to be used in this particular circ circumstances? Or how do you think gov government should uh, write the policy around uh, X technology, facial recognition being a good example of one we've done uh, a lot on. Um, so I thought there was some real threads that came through in quite a lot of uh, the presentations on that point. Who has the right to say what is measured? Um, Valter's point about who designs the kind of product, i.e. the facts. And the point about integrity and social license. You know, how do we gain the social license to operate? Um, we think it's by including as many views as possible um, from the public, from as many different perspectives, um, and to build these kind of overlapping areas of consensus on very tricky moral problems that um, are not easily, I think, pronounced upon by one group or another. Um, so that is not really an answer to anything, but gives you a bit, perhaps, of an insight into the kind of messy way in which we think about things. Thank you. Andrew, do you want to continue? Yeah, great. And uh, thank you for mentioning AI. Because uh, I've, I've taken a slightly different tack as well, and um, I work in drug development, um, and that's a highly regulated area. And, you know, one of the uh, things that strikes me is a quote by Harold Macmillan, which was events, dear boy, events. And in drug development, one of the biggest events was thalidomide, and that goes back probably 60 years or so now. Um, and that caused a massive change in, in, drug, in drug development and drug regulation. And now, it, I mean, there are hundreds of, of guidelines. There's a statistical principles guideline. There are points to consider on multiplicity, adaptive design, you name it. So there are hundreds, probably thousands of, of regulations around, perhaps, perhaps too many guidelines and regulations. But it all happened because of, of events. Um, and to some extent also by recognizing that um, a certain amount of unfairness around. So for instance, we have regulations around uh, inclusion of women in clinical trials. And that was because it was felt that women were being excluded from the benefits of clinical research. And on the one hand, there was a protective aspect to it. And again, going back to thalidomide, you can understand why. But people started to realize actually women were being excluded to the benefits of being in clinical trials. Same with paediatrics. Paediatrics were a sort of a, a group of individuals that were, uh, didn't have drugs developed for them. And so people, because people were so concerned about the risk, and it took the regulators a bit of time to actually encourage research to be done and created some financial incentives. So regulation tends to happen, I think, because of, of, of events and the need for it. And I, I did a talk a few years ago that suggested that the same thing will happen in essentially AI and data science around algorithms. And I haven't been proved right yet, but I'm sure I will be, because I'm sure there will be an event somewhere in the world which will cause people to say, that can't happen again. And you know, we have the, the known unknowns, we have the, sorry, the known knowns, we have the known unknowns, it's those unknown unknowns. There's the always the issue that gets us. And I think, I think regulation will come. But it got me thinking about algorithms and the Food and Drugs Administration and how would they go about um, approving an algorithm if it were a drug. So for me, there are sort of five, five steps that you do. The first one is demonstrate benefit. So if you're developing a drug, if it hasn't got a benefit, don't even bother going to the regulators. 
There's no point worrying about safety if it doesn't have a benefit. So if you develop an algorithm, you, you want it to have a benefit, is number one. Second thing is, do, do the bene benefits exceed the harm? The next thing is restrict its use to minimize the harm. So again, in drug development, you, you have certain labeling, certainly initially, that restricts the use of the drug because within a certain sort of range. So restrict uh, use to avoid harm. The next thing to do would be monitor harm throughout the life cycle of the drug or throughout the life cycle of the algorithm. So this gets away a little bit from the, you make a decision about something and then you do the research and don't worry about it versus doing something and then following it up over a period of time, which I didn't hear too much about. But I think with algorithms, it is something that you have to maintain. And then, uh, and then essentially again with drug development, you amend the label as new evidence comes through. So again here, you would, you would amend your use of the algorithm as new data came in. And then it got me thinking a little bit about more about, about big data in general. We heard a little bit about, about data science, uh, a little bit about AI. And in some of the work we've done in the past with the ADRN and the research accreditation panel now, we do deal a lot with big data. A lot of it is administrative data, it's linking data. Very seldom though, is it around algorithms. And I do think there was a real distinction between the sort of the control over the, generated, the, control over the data generating process, which is, can be randomized clinical trials, it can be sampling, it can be surveys versus the sort of the data exhaust or the administrative data, which is big data. And let's face it, you know, that the pandemic was a big data pandemic. It was pulling data from all different, different areas. And it was a statistical pandemic because we, we lots of randomized clinical trials of the vaccines, it was the ONS infection survey. It was a real sort of tour de force of, of some basic statistical principles, the big, the big, big data coming through. I don't think it was an AI pandemic. I really don't, because you know, for me, the AI component of it is, is getting data and then putting it through an algorithm to make decisions. And I think that bit was actually pretty poor. And some of the prediction models actually didn't work terribly well. And I mean, my final point really is going back to, I guess, the, the ethics and the public's view on big data. And I'm not sure it's been teased out yet, the difference between a research project using lots of big data, anonymized, to inform policy versus using lots of big data to develop an algorithm that will then be used to make individual decisions later on, perhaps even on the people that contributed to the data. And I think they are two very different, they're not, they're not basically different sides of the same coin. They're, they're, I think they're very different. I think that needs to be teased out more with the public on, um, on, the, on the ethics of, of this. And it, it is very nuanced. I think the work so far that I've seen, when the public have been interviewed in, in, in forums about these things, once they get to understand what's being done with the data, that they're, they're generally pretty supportive of it. Um, but I think the algorithm one is very different and we need to work a little bit more on getting the, the public's understanding of that. Thank you very much. I'm going to open this up for discussion. So, uh, Denise, I think yeah. you had your hand up first. Um, which was the school uh, results, the replacement for the O levels and A levels. That was your second example of the, the use of an algorithm. Mm. Well, that, that, that is a, a very good example. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in that, there was a stats and raw data ethics meeting on precisely mm. that. Yeah. Mm. Or the, the October economic platform is yet to form. Because that, that brought in Harvard as well as Scotland and England. Mm. And did it bring in the, the, the public's view yes. on it? Yes. Okay, mm. great. Mm. It might also be interesting to note on this point about. Um, was it an AI pandemic and, and connected to this question of public trust, the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, which is the government kind of data ethics body within government, they did a survey just recently, I think they published in the last couple of weeks, 
and it found that kind of public trust in com and comfort in government use of data has gone down in the last, at least in the last year. And in particular, they asked about um, public trust in government to use data to respond to the pandemic, and that has gone down as well over the course of the last year quite significantly. So I don't know if that's um, the public seeing the not seeing the benefits come through, perhaps, or other contextual factors that I think also influence trust in government more generally, generally relates to trust in government use of data, right? So those numbers might be, and I should, I'm way out of my depth talking statistics to statisticians here, but that those numbers might be married if you just ask about trust in government generally, given all of the um, fluctuation in government this year, I suppose. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask about whether there is deliberate disinformation campaigns, um, but on the other hand, it may be that the misinformation um, arises from insufficient thoughts about how to grow things in public. And we've had care.data mentioned, but a more recent uh, GP database, um, which was launched, um, and, um, has, and actually resulted in more opt-outs and thus more damage to research, but how this, um, this was a deliberate campaign <laughs> against it, um, and it was a social media campaign which was saying um, how different things, but the government is going to sell your data, or all, all, all our NHS data to American private company, if you want to opt out, um, uh, click here. It actually took you out to, to the page on NHS Digital's um, website, which was for opting out of your data being used for research. It was nothing about selling anything to anybody. Um, mm. That um, the and um, this this GP uh, and it was also said or your your record in its entirety. NHS Digital's website clearly said um, uh, you know, only, only clinical codes would be sent, not the, um, the um, free text and people saying, well, that's when we're going to share our intimate um, uh, secrets with our GPs. Well, that would appear in the, in the, in the free text, not in the codes. Um, and, I mean, this came... So, 
Right. Before you respond, sorry, well, I've got to move things along. Yeah. So basically, uh, So before you respond to that, I want to, I think it might be two other points, and let's try and take them all, and then you can respond uh, if you can keep them in your head. There was somebody at the back, I think, um, wanted to raise an issue. Otherwise, it was John, you, you had a point. Oh, yes, yes, it was you, yeah. I'm not sure I had my hands up, I was thinking of putting my hands up. This is mainly the trolley, I think, but earlier I asked you this question about the people being given data only if they're deemed to be using the appropriate use. come back to that when we talk about future directions, uh, but John and then Tom. before I ask you both to reply, so it was here. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, Richard Barton from um, the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, thank you. So I, I just wanted to um, ask about a, a few people have mentioned the concept of trust, and I'm quite interested in, in trust in various parts of um, the institutions who are charged with making decisions about data access. And it, it, it's all sort of stemmed from um, a decision which was made when I was working 
Mark Hancock knocking, knocking on your doorstep. Um, a lot of issues have been raised there, uh, issues about misleadingness, about harm, about trust, about power, uh, and about uh, the participation of statisticians in uh, mm. other areas mm. that are linked in here. So, mm. Carly, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, well, I suppose one thread I would try to draw through in a comment I had meant to make at the start was, it seems to me, having listened today, statisticians really are the victim of um, a lot of harm done uh, on public trust when it comes to data, but not done by statisticians, <laughs> done in, you know, primarily by big tech companies whose actions over the course of the last decade have left people feeling quite vulnerable, like they don't have much agency, that they can't control who has what data about them, and um, that it's not something that they have any um, uh, kind of legitimacy with regards to. And I think it's really important to understand that while you may not be the cause of that distrust, you certainly have to operate with respect to it and acknowledging it and then rebuilding from, from scratch. And I would say the same um, to various parts of government who feel that we, they want to be able to do good things with data that will benefit people, but they feel frustrated when people feel a lack of trust in them in doing that or feel wary about government um, initiatives to collect and use data. And I, I think you just have to acknowledge that the starting point is very low levels of public trust in the use of data by anybody's, uh, in particular corporate actors, um, but that is inherited by much more well-meaning actors. So, you know, I would say on the GPD, uh, GPDPR, the data um, initiative from last year, um, you know, misinformation breeds in um, information vacuums and I think there was probably a misstep to allow an information vacuum to emerge so there could be much more front-footedness in terms of the program being rolled out to say this is what it's for, this is what it's not going to do, you are looped in, this is not a scandal that you're finding out about on Facebook but rather we're proactively communicating. I think the NHS are getting better and better about that and I, you know, I think last year was a bit of a misstep. But, you know, they have the history of the DeepMind Royal Free Hospital um, exchange of data, which, again, got blown up into a huge thing that probably shouldn't have been the size and, you know, of and concern that it ultimately was. But um, that misinformation was allowed to kind of breed. Um, so I think proactive disclosure of information, being upfront with people um, and honest is really, really important. Um, on the point about personal definitions of harm, I mean, it's interesting that you're we're on the board of Full Fact because obviously Full Fact has played such an important role when it comes to misinformation breeding. Um, but one thing we've seen engaging with members of the public, whether it be on the governance of biometrics technology or on the use of health data to um, respond to the pandemic, has been that people are quite good at, um, when, when they've got all the information and you're consulting them, as equals. They're quite good at understanding cost-benefit analysis and, and being prepared to take um, sacrifices that benefit others. Like we've seen really people, particularly during the pandemic, saying, I'm very prepared to put my personal concerns around privacy aside if it benefits the whole, if it's done in a really robust and rigorous way, if there's the proper protections in place. And we've heard lots of people come out when we've done consultations on the use of data to respond to the pandemic and say, my main concern is, is this going to work for everyone? Does everybody get a fair go from this? Um, and or are certain groups going to be left behind? So, um, whereas I, I, I agree that probably every person defines definitions of harm differently, I think you can come to a societal consensus around cost-benefit when it comes to data and data use if you do the right type of informed consultation, which I think relates to the GP data thing. So, getting on the front foot, bringing people into conversation. We published a report a couple of years ago called Participatory Data Stewardship, which sets out kind of five different levels of uh, public consultation you can do at the you know, the bottom level, the basic level, it's just about informing people. But over the spectrum, it's about bringing them in, empowering them to make decisions, get, handing over some power for, to them. So, for example, um, the Genomics England has um, patient panels that have some right in making decisions about how, how data is used. So bringing people in and making sure you have a diverse set of people contributing, I think, is really key to rebuilding this trust, which has just been so broken over the past decade or so. Um, the other thing, just on Tom's point, I agree there should be statisticians in more conversations. I mean, what we've seen in and around the pandemic is that big tech companies are saying we can fill the gap that you need more data to inform policy making and decision making. Um, and we have that data. 
and it seems like that should equally or alternatively be a role for statisticians to be playing. Um, I don't really know the politics of that, I have to admit. Um, and certainly we'd like to see more data taken out of the private sector and put in the hands of public sector entities like um, statisticians um, on an you know, anonymised basis to inform that kind of policy making. Um, and in fact, we've just published a big piece of work called Rethinking Data, where we've put out some big interventions that we think could happen in the data ecosystem to start to rebalance power between public and private sector. And one of those would be something like setting up a BBC for data, where you could kind of mandate um, access to private sector data, such as is in the Digital Economy Bill, but building on those types of provisions and, um, and really looking at how you take data out of kind of these siloed places and put them into the hands of those who are using it for the public good. And so we'd like to see more, more of that. Thank you. Andrew. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with what you're saying ent entirely. I, I mean, trying to pick up on some of the questions. I love the question about, you know, are data trust, trustworthy? Um, and I suppose if you go back to Baroness O'Neill's you know, three, uh, three, three points, wasn't it? it it's, it's integrity, competence, and uh, reliability. I, I think there's three, aren't there? So I don't know which one, which box you, you, you didn't tick there. But I mean, it, I, I think data trust is a really good idea. Um, and it seems to me that the, the debate around data is so nuanced, um, and each case is, is, is so different, that expecting you know, 60 million people or whatever to make individual decisions uh, is, is, is not necessarily the, the, the best way forward. And you don't know what your future use of the data is going to be, but, but clearly there is benefit in a lot of cases from using it. So I, actually, I personally like the idea of a data trust, so I've not been involved in one. Um, and I think it's bizarre that they would be regarded as, as untrustworthy, but I mean, I mean, I think it could be addressed. Um, and I shouldn't put you off from, from trying again, I would say, because um, I think it, it, is, it is a good way forward. Um, the second one was about harms. I, th I think it is difficult to, to define harms, but I wouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. I, I do think there are some obvious ones, and I think it's a useful way of, of framing it. Um, and there is always going to be something you know, in, in, you know, on, on the threshold that's going to be quite hard. I mean, the fairness comes into it quite a bit as well. Um, a lot of work on fairness, and it's, it's quite hard. You, know, you, you can define it in so many different ways. You can actually come up with examples where it can't be fair in every single way. Um, so the, there's a lots, of, lots of issues with all these concepts, but I don't think it should stop us from looking into them more and, and understanding them. And the, the third one, I think, was around about uh, should statisticians be more involved? I think statisticians and data scientists should be more involved in these things. I know the data science section, going back a few years, it was one of the four hot topics that we took around the country to have at, at meetings. Um, and there was, a, there was a paper subsequently written on it. And, and, and I, I do think that there was a big push at that stage to say that there should be more data ethics uh, training done for data scientists because um, you need to understand the nuances, you need to understand where your data is coming from, you need to understand how it's being used. So I do think both, both statisticians and data scientists should, should be involved in it and they should be trained in it as well. So I think there's opportunities there for, for organisations like the RSS yeah. uh, and the Lovelace Institute, the Lovelace Institute to be involved in doing more, more of that for the, for the community. And I'll take the final point from Valka. Yes, um, I think um, we tend to work in silos as scientists. Um, and here I think uh, we could profit from looking to a silo in the middle, which is called sociology of quantification. This is, uh, let's say, for us, promising new branch in sociology, which deal with the processes of quantification, impact, harm, benefit, and all these things. And uh, I, I could assume uh, that we statisticians could really uh, profit a lot if we worked closer together with our teams and uh, mm -hmm. in this branch of sociology. Mm -hmm. A tough agenda, but I yes. do agree with you. Except you get the sociologist set, set in ethics. Ah. <laughs> Rather than going to philosophers who might be rather broader minded. Indeed. Um, <laughs> We're coming towards the end of uh, today. Let me just re reflect a little bit. Uh, we, there's a session down on the programme that says future plans. Well, we're not really going to get into that now. We just don't have the time. 
You've noticed we've been recording these sessions and we will ask all of the speakers if they could make their presentations available or the text of their talk if they have that, if that could be made available. And we will use this to produce a report, a fairly short report, where we could pull out some of the key uh, points, uh, issues that have been raised this afternoon. The whole purpose of this meeting was for us within the data ethics and governance section to have some further participation, guidance, reflections in terms of where we go with our work over the next year. And I think that's been very useful for us indeed. There's a lot of points have been raised and will continue to be raised. And, and I think this will, what you've told us, the presentations that we've had, the discussion we've had, has, has been very, very useful indeed in terms of uh, where we think we might go from here. But we want to do that in a very open and participatory way. And so uh, my hope is that once we get a report on this conference, it will have some suggestions in there, and there'll be suggestions about the way forward. And we would invite all of you here, and more widely, obviously, uh, to, to respond, to reflect, and to, to, to help us to set some priorities. There is a huge amount of work to be done in this area. We haven't touched on points uh, that some of us have raised, uh, and, and we, we really ought, ought to. So um, all I can say is thank you all very much for attending. This was our first face-to-face -face meeting as a section, and I'm very pleased with the attendance that we've had and the participation that we've had. And it, I think it really points the way to, in future, hopefully having either more meetings like this or hybrid meetings as well, so we can bring in people from other parts of the world rather than having to uh, bring you here in person. Mm. So thank you all very much, and a big thank you to our speakers today. <laughs>